It is week three of the Woods Watch Party as our trip down Dartmouth football's memory lane continues. So far, we've seen a back and forth battle with UNH and a down to the wire duel with Holy Cross. But this week, as we travel back to October 7th, 2017, the Big Green will take on Ivy League rival Yale and they'll need to find a brand new way to win. In fact, they'll have to do something that no other Dartmouth football team has done before. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Woods Watch Party. I'm ESPN Plus Dartmouth football broadcaster Tyler Murray. We've got a great one for you today. It's 3-0 Dartmouth hosting 3-0 Yale for homecoming at Memorial Field 2017. Let's introduce our special guests for today's broadcast. We've got four stars and coaches of the game. So glad to have you all with us. First, from Houston, Texas, it's wide receiver Drew Honeycutt. Hi, Drew. Hey, Tyler. How's it going? Going great. Thank you so much for being here. Look out for Drew number 83, the wide receiver for the Big Green in this game replay. And then in Hanover, New Hampshire, paying a visit back to Dartmouth, this defensive back, Kyron McKinney Crudden. Hey, how's it going? Uh, I'm really excited to be here. I've had a lot of fun watching the games the past few weeks. So, uh, again, I'm excited to join. Thanks for having me. Two-time captain checks and very excited to have you here. And then the coaches, associate head coach in charge of secondary and special teams, it's Sammy McCorkle. Hey, Tyler, how you doing? Appreciate you having me. Really excited to be here with all you guys and look forward to getting a chance to watch this exciting game. Same here. And we've got offensive coordinator Kevin Dapt is going to be reliving a game from his very first season in Hanover. Hey, Coach. How's it going, Tyler? Thanks for having me. Uh, really excited to, to check this game out. It's been a while. We're going to dive right into it, but first we want to thank Milton Cat for being the presenting partner of today's game. Milton Cat is your complete source for Caterpillar machines, engines, generators, technology, parts, and service in the Northeast. So let's dive right in, and there was a theme developing, developing about the 2017 season. I want to ask you first, Coach McCorkle, the last two games coming into this one, an overtime win over Holy Cross, and then on the final play against Penn, Jared Gerbino punches it in. So you come in 3-0, and and it feels like nail biters are happening every week. What was it about this team that led to close games and allowed the squad to pull off so many clutch plays late in these games? Well, I just think it's just the the, the overall confidence of the entire squad, uh, realizing that, uh, you know, you, you play four quarters. Uh, we, well, we train, we practice, we prepared um, every week, preseason in the spring to, to put yourself in those situations. And we knew it was going to kind of be that kind of season. We knew that the talent level and the, uh, the talent of our schedule of that, of this, of that season was going to be one of those that has some really good teams. So we anticipated there were going to be some, some dog fights and that's, you know, we prepared ourselves for it. No difference here with Yale. It was an offense that had put up 40-plus points in each of his first three games, and I'll open it up to the players to start, and I'd love to hear from all of you. What was the mindset coming into this game against Yale? Always a rivalry in any Ivy League game, but these guys have been stacking up the points. So uh, we'll ask the defensive captain, Kai, what did you think about these guys coming in? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the, the big thing for us was I believe this was after our, our uh, last second pen victory. Um, so, again, trying to roll that momentum, uh, momentum into the next week. Um, I think taking on Penn, uh, who was also a very high-powered offense, gave us a lot of confidence. Um, you know, trying to bottle up Justin Watson the week before, who's now an NFL guy, um, and, and doing a, a pretty good job at that. Uh, not 100% is he, he had an all right game, but that gave us confidence going into this one um, to, to, you know, perform in and try to get another victory. Yeah, I think from the offensive standpoint, um, we were just wanting to start fast and definitely in this game, that's something that we, we didn't do as well as maybe some other games that um, we started out a little better. But we also knew that um, the guys that we had on defense were going to keep us in the game. And um, if we were able to you know, put points up, they were going to give us an opportunity to um, ultimately come out with a victory. And I think, Tyler, one of the things we, we, we prepared ourselves coming into this game, like you said, you know, this is a high-powered offense at that time. Uh, their quarterback, Rollins, I think he led the nation in completion percentage at the time. Uh, they were, you know, they were averaging 41 points a game coming in. Um, but, you know, we've faced teams like that before. Um, but I think we, we kind of knew coming in that, you know, it was going to be a battle. We had to weather the storm. And that's kind of what our mindset was the whole time was they're going to get their yards. They're going to get their catches. 
Um, but let's limit, let's limit the explosive plays was our, was our biggest thing on our side. Well. And then Kevin, for you, as you watch the defense get a nice early third down stop, you're about to see your offense go to work for the first time here against Yale. What was your impression of the Bulldogs defense coming into this matchup? Uh, they were really good defense. Um, they were solid. Obviously, you know, they were starting three, you know, so, um, you know, was, I was new to the league, but I heard a lot about Yale and they're doing a nice job to start that season. So, um, you know, part of it was kind of feeling them out at the start of the game. We obviously got to a slow start, um, but uh, defense kept us in it. Um, you know, I think drawing on those first couple few games where uh, we played some of those close games and, you know, we found a way to win and found a way to pull it out, um, you know, was, was big in our, our character and of our players. And, uh, you know, me do, being new there, I think a little bit we were figuring out who we were, what, what things we did best. Uh, Jared Jabino was just starting to get some, some time and figuring out what we had there. So, um, you know, we, do, we found a way, though, you know, one way or another in those first couple games. And so now it was just a matter of figuring out this game because it definitely started off, uh, started off pretty slow in that first half. Emory Thompson and Steven Johnston are already over there. Quarterback look right now is coming back left and Yale. And this isn't, I guess it's the first, uh, second full year really for, for, for Jack Hennigan as a starting quarterback, Matthew, right? So you would come in after he had put Jack together a, some good work. Uh, what was it like working with him, now. Coach Daft, and installing a different system for him? It, it seemed to work for him uh, no matter who was the coordinator. Yeah, he was He was an unbelievable talent. Um, very One of the smartest players I've ever been around. Uh, one of the hardest working guys I've ever been around. Um, I remember him coming in and, you know, on my first off season and just wanting to soak it all up. He wanted more film, wanted, wanted to talk about it more. And, you know, he was a guy that was very driven, very focused. Um, you know, it makes my life a lot easier, you know, because he could take the coaching and and he would take it and run with it and spend time after practice. And he was able to get the footwork down very fast. Um, and, uh, you know, he was, he was a guy that could, uh, you know, his character, his leadership, um, you know, you could see it throughout the season um, and just all of our close games and some, some adversity, especially the first half of this game, you know, they, uh, you know, they shook us pretty good in that first half. And, you know, he came back in the second half and you'll see in a little bit, he did a nice job. Yeah, and going off of that, um, you know, definitely during this game, we were facing a lot of adversity. And Jack has, you know, always been known as very calm, cool, and collected. And I think, you know, going into halftime, and it's really easy to, you know, kind of be out and think that this game is out of reach. And he's one of those guys like, hey, we're fine. Let's keep going. Um, and I think it says a lot about, you know, his leadership. And he made a, a big impact um, coming out of the second half. And I think also, I think that, you know, like Kevin mentioned and Drew's talking about just off the field, extra time, extra work. I think that was something that was contagious. I, you know, that's one thing that we're very fortunate with our program. We have a lot of guys who spend the extra time, prepare themselves for game, watch video on their, you know, on their own time. And everybody thinks you just show up on Saturday and go play. That's not, that's not when it happened. You win the game on the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And, uh, but our guys did do a phenomenal job of putting in that extra time to make sure that they're prepared, you know, not just physically, but mentally uh, for that, for that, for the next opponent. I think also uh, one thing about QBJ, um, especially watching the, the past few games over the last few weeks, you know, everyone says they're surprised that QBJ turned out to be such a good runner um, that they didn't think he was that athletic. But I'm sure Coach Mack remembers that there was a lot of winters where Jack was absolutely destroying the DBs and conditioning drills. And uh, we definitely got chewed out quite a few times because of Jack. Um, so I'm definitely – I was definitely never surprised when Jack was running because um, I was on the, uh, the wrong end of, of QBJ's quote-unquote not athleticism. Uh, a couple times, so uh, I just that decept that deceptive long stride he had. That's what it was. Right. <laughs> exactly. So, so I, I always knew Jack was an athlete because he was always making us look bad in conditioning. With Jackson Perry and Jeremiah Duchesne. Poor Kai. Kai probably thought he wasn't going to ever have to watch a game with me again. You probably had a nightmare when he heard him and I were going to be on this together, Tyler. Oh, uh, and this game too. As soon as I knew it was this game, there was like there's about four or five plays that flashed in my mind immediately. 
Um, to be honest, I, I texted Ryder last week. Um, I, I asked him to make me look good on my, my couple good plays in Holy Cross because I knew this one was going to be a little tough. Uh, I think this might have been my one of my biggest minus games of, <laughs> of my career. So it'll be fun to watch it. Uh, I guess fun is one word you can use. Is it true that a lot of guys remember some of the negative plays more than the positives? Because we had Ryder on for a game where he passed 1,000 yards, had a 44-yard touchdown, and he was like, I think this is coming back to me a bit. I don't really remember what's going, what, what's happening. But uh, it seems like you've got this one pretty, uh, pretty crystal clear, Kyron, even though you, I thought you had a pretty good game. I've watched this a couple of times now. I, I didn't think you were uh, so far at all. I mean, it's, it's just one of those things I think you really saw with Ryder last week as well. Um, you know, those bad plays stick with you. I mean, it's like, you know, I, like I said, I can remember probably every missed tackle I had at Dartmouth. Um, I know there's a couple games where I ended up with a lot of tackles, but those tackles were supposed to be pass breakups. Um, so, yeah, it's just one of those things that, uh, you know, it, it doesn't ever leave you. The bad ones stick out way more than the good ones do. Um, and I think I think you saw Ryder getting real frustrated last week, um, which was kind of funny to watch. Um, but that's that's really what it feels like, especially watching some of these uh, these old games. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think that there was never a, a Sunday that when we go in and watch film that I was excited to go and watch film, even after this game where you know you have a crazy comeback and um, you know everyone just did well, but you think about those plays that you messed up and you know that Coach Daff, you know that Coach Taylor is going to say something like, hey, what were you thinking here? Because um, we're moving on to the next game, and I think that that was one thing that really helped us is, you know, even when we did have success, we were able to, um, you know, celebrate that, but then quickly move on and be able to prepare for the next opponent. I think that's what made you guys great players, though. I mean, you guys are perfectionists and – you know, you don't get complacent with with some of the plays and keep pushing yourself because, um, you know, you guys have done a great job. You need more guys like that that, that take a lot of pride in what they do. Yeah, we're trying to create a more of a relaxed film session atmosphere here, guys. So you, you seem very casual so far. That's excellent. Excellent to see. And uh, early on, Coach Daft, I'm sure, you know, every offensive coordinator would love to call that play action deep bomb and make a real statement early. But – is this kind of a, an establishing the run mode for you, or, or do you remember what, what mindset you wanted to, to get your offensive players in at this point early? You know, we're always trying to, to be balanced and to mix it up, uh, try and get the, the ball in our playmakers' hands so they have a chance to, to make some plays, um, you know, try and distribute the ball. And, and Jack did a nice job. I mean, but the defense, they were all over us, as you can see right there, some tight coverage. And so we just had a tough time getting a rhythm to start this game. Um, and, uh, you know, but the guys, the guys fought through it and, uh, they, you know, keep plugging away. And like I said, it's, it's always nice when you have a really good defense on your team, they're going to keep you in some ball games. We had a 24 yard run from Ryder stone there, which is the, the highlight play early on here. And he just seemed like from, especially watching these classic games, just like a different kind of energy out of the backfield. Not the biggest guy, but when, when he made contact with a defensive player, almost like a Jared Gerbino, he would always be falling forward. I was always impressed watching him out of the backfield. Yeah, he's a very decisive runner. Um, and, and we talked to him about that a lot. And, you know, one step cuts and, and hitting the holes and not dancing and losing yardage and that sort of thing. So, um, he's also one of the strongest guys on the team. I think he had one of the highest squats out of anyone. I mean, uh, Drew and Kai, you might be able to know his numbers, but I, that always helps. You know, when, you, when you're falling forward for another one or two yards and, and breaking tackles, those, those add up over time. Yeah, I, um, actually the first few years, Ryder and I were uh, lifting partners in the weight room pretty often. Uh, good play there by Bun. Um, and so, yeah, definitely it helped me a lot working out with Ryder because he is an absolute workhorse. Um, you know, he's got that farm boy strength that you just don't see every single day. Um, and I think one of the great things about Ryder is he had a really good early start to his career and then had to battle through a lot of injuries um, in the middle part of his career. He kept getting banged up. Um, and then, you know, senior year, he came back around and had a great, you know, senior season, um, which was really cool to see him, you know, battle through that adversity um, and make it out and, um, you know, really leave a strong impression on everyone. Yeah, another thing about Ryder, I think, is um, – 
obviously he was, you know, very strong and gifted, but, um, you know, with the young guys, especially, I remember him kind of taking some of us under his wing and, and really making sure that um, we knew the importance of, you know, staying after practice and getting extra reps or, um, you know, doing extra things in the weight room um, like he had done. And so not only was he a great example of it, but he also encouraged us constantly to you know, kind of do the same. And he had one of our, our favorite recruiting stories last week on our Woods Watch party as pretty impressive quarterback run there from Kurt Rawlings. Apparently didn't get much attention in Calgary, but then Ryder did a post-grad year at in New England, and there was a connection with the baseball coach at Dartmouth who told Buddy Tevens, you got to check this guy out. And that's how he became a college athlete and eventually a professional running back. Uh, Kai and then Drew, we'd love to hear uh, your recruiting stories while we have a bit of a slow start to this game, a lot of punting early, but why Dartmouth, uh, how the recruiting process went, and uh, ultimately how you made your decision. Salter up the middle, brought down by trainer. Um, I can go ahead, Kai. Um, yeah, so I didn't actually really know that I wanted to play college football until probably junior year. Um, you know, was starting to have some success and was starting to get some look. I remember I was in math class and uh, Coach Hankton, the receivers coach before I um, was at Dartmouth, he came into our, our class and was like, hey, can I pull you aside and just talk about Dartmouth? And, you know, I knew it was a great academic school, but – um, I'd never really, you know, even watched an Ivy League football game or um, seen any of that. So that's kind of how we got the ball rolling, went to a few camps up here in the Northeast. And um, I think that the thing about Dartmouth was I, you know, was born and raised in Texas and always wanted to, you know, probably go to a Texas school. And so going all the way to New Hampshire was really, really scary for me. And, and also my family, I know that you know, as you know, our family was very close and that was going to be a strain on us to be that apart. Um, but the weekend of my visit that I came up to Hanover, um, not only did the players and the coaches, but just everybody in the town makes you feel so special and everybody knows everybody because it is so small. Um, and I think that Coach Stevens is the one that put my, my mom and my dad um, at peace with me you know, the ultimate was my decision, but um, they kind of gave their blessing after, you know, Coach Stevens won them over. Yeah, and then uh, for, for me, um, so I I guess I wasn't formally recruited by Dartmouth, um, you know, technically listed as a walk-on. Um, basically, I, I had kind of a, a rough recruiting uh, senior year, had a, a fracture in my leg, so had a had a rough season. Um, had uh, a few scholarship offers from some schools that I just really wasn't interested in. Um, academics was very important to me, and the uh, schools that I had offers from just didn't really um, bring that same level of academics that I was looking for. Um, so then I kind of looked at some preferred walk-on options um, and was between, you know, trying to play at Dartmouth or trying to play at Duke. Um, and so I came up to Dartmouth in a, during a spring. It was, like, it was like a Saturday spring practice or something. Um, and, you know, Coach T still had me in his office. Um, he gave me the, you know, do you want to play professional football? What do you want to do after that? Um, again, I think JD said it last week. Um, not something that you hear from head coaches, um, you know, all the time. I was a, a big player right there. Um, so, so again, and, and Drew just touched on it, like everyone I met when I was on camp, saw the coaches, all the players, um, and then people that weren't even affiliated with the football team. Uh, it just seemed like such an amazing place to be. Everyone was, you know, happy to be there. Um, extremely welcoming. It felt like a family environment. Um, and so for me, that was the biggest thing. Um, and I just felt right at home right away. Um, you know, actually the, the very first football player I met was JD. Um, he, I think he was like hurt during spring ball. I think he was also maybe in a little bit of trouble at the time, uh, young JD, um, and just sat there and talked with him for an entire practice. Um, and it was just, again, it felt like I was at home already. Um, so I'm, I mean, going to Darwin was the best thing to happen to me. Um, I absolutely loved it there. I um, still love it to this day, so uh, it was great. 
for a long pass. Sounds like the feeling is mutual with the uh, teammates and, and coaches who were uh, you're involved with here as we uh, do have our first score of the game. Pretty long bomb there. That wound up being 46 yards to Christopher Williams Lopez. Now, he came in as the active career leading receiver for the Bulldogs. Was he a guy? Coach McCorkley had kind of circled on the depth chart to make sure you at least tried to shut him down because he has himself a pretty good day here. Yeah, you know, you definitely, you know, he was a leading receiver coming into the game. Um, you know, at that time, Yale had about, you know, they had a good group of wide receivers at that time. Um, you know, obviously, we were trying to do some things to, to make sure we put ourselves in a situation to know where he's at. Um, you know, like I said, our biggest thing was, you know, to, to not give up the big play. And, you know, right there you saw that's, that, that's a big play. So that's something, obviously, we did not want to happen. Um, but once again, we just, you know, you learn from it and move on. You got to forget about it and try to correct it and, and keep that from happening too many times. Yeah, I think he was also uh, Ross Woods' high school teammate. Is that yeah. is that true? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I I recruited him when he was injured at Great Atlanta Christian. So you know, I knew what he could do in high school. So he obviously, you know, he was a guy that we recruited and he chose to go to Yale. So but we definitely are well aware of what his ability was um, since he was in high school. Yeah, I think I uh, end up on the wrong side of the highlight tape here in the second quarter at some point. So uh, that'll, that'll be interesting to see. <laughs> I do have a star next to a second quarter play saying, ask Kai about his reaction. So we'll be, we'll be ready for that one. Uh, yeah, I got, a, I got a fun story for that one. Oh, excellent, excellent. I'll keep it clean, Kai. I'll keep it clean. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's clean. That's for no, sure. I said I'll keep it clean. <laughs> you talked about the, the recruiting battles that can, can happen behind the scenes. Where do you guys rank Yale if you have a list of biggest rivals for Dartmouth? We said earlier every Ivy League game feels like it's a rivalry, but uh, at least for this year, the 2017 year, maybe even your class, did you rank one team over the other that you really wanted to beat coming into an Ivy League season? Yeah, you know, I, you know, I just know, you know, you know, Yale is always at the top of my list. Um, you know, um, I know the year before, you know, we, we pretty much led the entire game and uh, we had some breakdowns toward the end of the game and, and we let that one slip away. So that was a bad taste in our mouth. And uh, so definitely after 2016, it was, you know, obviously you're focused on each week, um, but you always got in the back of your mind, you know, just, you know, trying to get that rematch and, and get a chance to make up for what you thought, you know, you had an opportunity to close it out in New Haven. Um, we look forward to having a chance to play them again the next year. Bulldogs just hit for a long touchdown pass. I think uh, one thing that was interesting or always interesting for me with Yale was um, typically they're, they're a pretty large team. Like you'll see their guys up front are pretty big, um, especially compared to some of the other teams in the league. And I think very they seem to try to pride themselves on, you know, being the biggest, strongest team in the league. Um, but again, I, I think you've heard many times before, uh, we have a great strength program with Coach Brown. Um, and that's something that we pride ourselves in is our, our strength, our conditioning. Um, and being able to grind out games. So I think that for me, that was always one of the things facing Yale um, was it was that really good opportunity to, to really test, you know, who was the, the biggest, baddest on the yard that day. Um, and, you know, fortunately today we are in this game, we showed it. Um, and, you know, I think that that is just a testament to our strength conditioning program, um, being able to, you know, keep guys strong, keep guys healthy um, and play for all four quarters or more if need be. Yeah, as you mentioned earlier, um, every game does feel like a, a rivalry game um, just because it is the Ivy League and, you know, best record is, is who wins the, uh, the championship. But Yale for me was a t uh, school that, you know, I was being recruited at and I think it really did come down to Yale and Dartmouth. And so especially to be able to come out and perform against a school that um, you potentially could have gone to is something that um, is special to be able to kind of look back on. But and then also to kind of touch on the strength and conditioning program, um, Coach Brown is one of my favorite people in this world. I mean, we still text to this day, um, you know, about strength stuff, but also just life. And um, he is, he's a character. He, He's somebody that you want to wake up at, you know, 5.30 and, and see because he will get you in the right mindset to, to go and have fun. I think that, you know, it sometimes is difficult to get up early in the morning and, and do these grueling workouts, but he truly made it um, a fun thing for us to do. And I think 
anytime you visit the weight room and the football team's in there, um, you're going to hear the word juice. And uh, that is that is just something that I, I don't think that every school is getting that hyped up about um, for, you know, 6 a.m. lift. So uh, the strength and conditioning program here was, um, you know, second to none. Yeah, I saw you a uh, four-yard rush from their quarterback, Rawlings, there. You got your first tackle credited, but, uh, well, you thought you should have had a sack? Yeah, that's um, that was definitely one of the, the first plays I thought of when I heard I was going to be uh, – on here talking about the Yale 2017 game. Uh, missed a sack there. Didn't end my career with any sacks. A big goose egg on the sack. So that's definitely a play that haunts me to this day. Um, we don't blitz very often. So you're supposed to really take advantage of it when it happens. And, and I blew it there. Um, I think my last, like, I think later on in the season, in like the Brown game, Coach Mack tried to get me a couple more blitzes. Didn't, didn't get the sacks there either. Um, so that, that one hurts. That one hurts a lot, not having a sack. <laughs> they just picked up one yard on fourth and one. So this drive is going to continue with – looks like time for just one more play in the first quarter. They're going to measure it. So sorry for the spoiler, but while we, while we have time, what's the mindset right now, guys? I mean, 7 nothing. the first handful of drives for Dartmouth – it was punts, averaging about 10 yards, but to only be down 7 nothing right now, you can't feel like your chances are, are too low to, to make a comeback. Yeah, yeah. We, we didn't have great field position to start. Like I said, we were a little bit off. I mean, the la last drive, Jack just missed Hunter Hagdorn uh, across the middle, which would have been a big play. And Hunter ended up uh, re-injuring his ankle on that one, too. Um, and, but it, it gave uh, Dylan Miller a chance to step up, which he did big time, so... We'll see that coming along here pretty soon. Yeah, that was something that I remember when Hunter went down. Um, I mean, Hunter was Ivy League Rookie of the Year, um, you know, always produced um, year in, year out. And him going down definitely forced us to make some adjustments to, you know, who's playing what position. Um, in, in the second half, especially when we were throwing a lot more and being in a four wide receiver set, um, being able to know every position, that was something that was coached by Coach Staff and Coach Taylor at the time. This is a 37-yard completion again to Christopher Williams-Lopez. He gets down inside the five-yard line, and this winds up being the final play of the first quarter. So we'll take a break here. 7 nothing Yale, and we're knocking on the door for another Homecoming in Hanover. We're back in a minute with the Woods Watch Party Week 3. Make your debit card green. Big green. Select from 16 options by visiting any Ledyard Bank location or calling 888-746-4562. Ledyard's online and mobile banking includes free personal mobile check deposit so you can show all your Dartmouth pride on your home turf. Equal housing lender, member FDIC. Domino's is serious about food safety. That's why your pizza stays untouched after baking at 450 degrees. And now that every delivery is contactless, you can safely mix and match any two or more for just $5.99 each when you sit around the table, even if it's not the same table. Second quarter underway and a long throw for Miel to get down into the red zone. And Coach McCorkle, what did you see there? Just a, a good throw or is there a breakdown back there? Yeah, they they probably caught us in the bad coverage there. Um, you know, once again, you know, just another big play that we, you know, we didn't want, they couldn't give up to Yale. And uh, but they caught us in the, in the coverage. It probably wasn't best for that type of route. Looked like they ran a guy in a wheel route up down the sideline. And uh, you know, it wasn't horrible coverage, but obviously it was completed, so it wasn't good coverage. So, but uh, you know, that was something that once again we you know we got to do a good. We came to the sideline, and hopefully we got to correct that. Quarterback Kurt Rawlings. And like yeah, with Rawlings, with Rawlings, Rawlings, your guy doesn't need to be open by that much. I mean, he's a pretty accurate passer. Yeah. And pretty experienced guy in the league. And yeah, we knew that coverage wise. We knew we had to mix up coverages. I um, mean, with a guy like him, you, know, you don't want to be in the same coverage every snap. Um, so we wanted to make sure we mixed it up as much as we possibly could just to, to make him have to work this entire game, which, you know, we're not making him work real hard here at the beginning, that's for sure. A pretty impressive athletic play to, to get in there. It's uh, Melvin Rouse, the second. 
The With a uh, couple green jerseys around there, but just enough to get in, and we'll double the lead here. With still plenty of time left, of course. Yeah, I mean, we actually we, we covered that pretty well. Um, you know, just we just didn't take very good angles, and we were a little hesitant on pulling the trigger on that one. And uh, once again, with him out in space, I mean, that's a guy you don't want the ball out in a lot of space, and it allowed him to make moves on it. So we were trying to to close space as quick as we possibly could. Drive that stalled, and now. Big green here at home with a big crowd in there. Kyle, you guys came into this game in the Ivy League ranked first in total defense, first in scoring defense, and that's far from the first time it's happened. It seemed like you could pick any week. You probably have those top rankings. Not a great start here, but in general, what made the defenses so dominant during your time at Dartmouth? Um, I mean, I think a couple of things. One, running to the ball. Um, I think you've heard that over the past couple of weeks. That's something that we absolutely pride ourselves in. If you don't do anything else, you run to the ball. If you don't run to the ball, you will be running, uh, you know, during or after practice. Um, had to learn that lesson the hard way a couple of times, Coach Mack. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing is tackling. Uh, again, we don't tackle to the ground, but we tackle probably more than anyone else in the country. Um, you know, we have tackle circuits every single day. One week is our one day a week is dedicated completely to tackling technique. Um, so those are really big things trying to limit, um, you know, missed tackles, limit yards after catch, um, things like that are big. Um, and then also, I mean, we just, we really love playing defense. Uh, our, our defensive coaches, I mean, they're absolutely great. Um, I don't know if you'll ever find someone who cares more about football than Coach Dobes. Um, it is true that he cries before every game, and it is the weirdest mix of getting you hyped up and emotional ever, um, but it gets you ready to go. Uh, Coach Brooks, I mean, he is he's like a, kind of like a dad to most of the guys on the defense or to a lot of guys. Um, Again, you know, it's real hard to find someone who cares more about, you know, players on the team than Coach Brooks. And Coach Mack is one of the most intense, one of the, uh, you know, most perfectionist people that I know. Um, it's something, definitely something that I appreciate. Um, I think that's probably, you know, part of the reason Coach Mack and I got along um, was because I, I try to be that way as well. Um, so just playing for, for all those guys. And then uh, Coach Kaffer came over um, towards the end of my career. Uh, again, was probably one of the best teachers of anything that I've had. Um, so just our coaches are, are unbelievable on the defensive side of the ball. Of the ball game for the big green. On the season, Thompson is the third leading receiver. Actually not tied and Coach Daff helps, helps guests get us ready, too. <laughs> Shout out to Coach Thanks, Daff. Guys, appreciate it. <laughs> all, those, all those formations getting us ready to go in spring ball. That's, that's tough. <laughs> Yeah, we were just off at the start of this game. I, I think it was, you know, even right there, that's a that's a pass that Jack would normally hit. And I want to remember, I think it was a little bit of a colder game, you know, which always plays a little bit of mind games with the quarterbacks. But, uh, you know. A little wet, too. A little rain, I think, early. So you're not just feeling frustration at this point. You're, you're yeah, feeling just as much as the, some of those guys would like some plays back, I would like some of those calls back, too. of the day, he's averaging 36 yards. I think that, um, especially going back to the week before um, with Penn, is a lot of the plays that we had success against them, um, Yale had game planned very well against us and we're kind of ready for it. And so that was something that that first half we, you know, we're kind of slowly making the adjustment of, you know, how are we going to attack them since they are playing, you know, what was recently our, you know, kind of bread and butter. Oh, there we go, Danny. Big play. That was a big play right there. Tell me about Danny McManus, guys, because I started covering Dartmouth in 2018, so I just I just missed out on the brothers. But, I mean, watching this guy on tape, I mean, I can see why he won team MVP. And so far, the Woods Watch Party, uh, the praise has been uh, immaculate on this guy. Seems like a great player and a great teammate. Uh, yeah, he definitely is. Um, again, I think they said it last week. He was a guy that was just always around the ball when we needed him to be. Um, just, uh, you know, super high football IQ, amazing football player, uh, had some of the quickest feet on the team. Um, and just like another one of those guys that's just like really fun to play with, uh, you know, 
typically always had a smile, smile on his face, was willing to do the extra work, um, and just kind of makes every day a little bit more fun. Super competitive. I mean, you can tell he's the youngest brother of two older ones. Um, so he had a fight for everything. Um, that's the mindset he had. Uh, he was going to compete every single day. Um, did not like to lose. Doesn't matter what we were doing, a drill or a game or whatever it was. Um, he did not accept losing. And uh, you know, he was a guy that you could you could push a couple buttons and get him rolling and get him fired up. And uh, you, know, you know, like you know, Yale would complete a pass against him, and you know that Danny was going to battle back. He wasn't going to go in the jar. Uh, he was able to come back and fight back. Made his way. Yeah, especially with Danny. I mean, what Kai said, he's, you know, very athletic, very, you know, high football IQ, but also just seemed like he, you know, was at the right place at the right time. Um, I think that all the McMahon I uh, were very good at, you know, being at that right place to make those special plays. And I think that, you know, that's a, a mix of the football IQ, but um, also just kind of having a, a knack for, you know, wanting to make those kind of plays. And there's the pressure. They've got him a sack. I know one thing early on in this game, too, that kind of hurts is, is uh, Gerbino was uh, injured his ankle late in the Penn game the week before, and so we didn't end up using him much in this game because of that and, and because we got behind pretty early. But, uh, you know, with him and Hunter out, we had to, we had to call on some other guys to, to help us out. That's something, Tyler, we talk about all the time, like Kevin's saying, you know, you know, we tell our guys everybody's got to be ready to play. And we play a lot of guys on both sides of the ball. We play a lot of young guys on special teams. So we do everything we possibly can to get everybody involved in a game situation. And we tell guys all the time, you never know when your number's going to be called. And our guys, especially in 2017, guys who maybe didn't anticipate to play as much as they were going to play that season actually had to step up and play a lot. And uh, they did a great job of preparing themselves. So when their number was called, they were ready to roll. So this was the game after we've mentioned it a couple of times, the Gerbino play on fourth and inches. I did not know he was injured in that game. So tell us about that decision. Uh, I guess you could have kicked a field goal to force overtime, but you're on the road. Uh, but you had a banged up quarterback. You, you thought he could get the job done and he was, you were right. Yeah, it's one of those things, you know, he, he had he had injured his ankle, rolled it in the in the game, but I think with the adrenaline and everything, um, we taped it up and, and he could finish that game. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think with the momentum, like you said, a, a away game, we're at the one-yard line. Um, the offensive line was feeling great, so um, we went ahead and tried to run in on that last play. Unfortunately, it worked out, and he found a way. He kind of ran over his own player a little bit. He ran right into the back of our right guard. Uh, Jack Anderson, but uh, you know it was a pretty exciting win. Yeah, we still uh, we still talk about that with Jack quite often. Um, there's there's definitely a picture of, of Jack right before it happened, uh, and you see Gervino getting ready to charge through, and so that's that's something we still uh, you know you know bust Jack for a little bit. Is that one where Buddy says, let's go for it, and you choose the play, Coach Daft, or what's the breakdown there? You know, I don't remember how that one actually played out. Um, I think, you know, I think the, the competitive nature of all of us, um, you know, we we're, hey, let's try and win this right now. And, and uh, so I think it was, we all we are on board for it. So, um, you know, fortunately, though, when those work out, you know, it makes it that much like it's a great call. So. But yeah, going into this game, you know, Drabino, you know, we knew that he was banged up. Um, and so I didn't use him, but maybe a couple times in this game. Um, and then, like I said, once we got behind, felt like we needed to throw it a little bit more. So yeah, Rawlings is opening it up a little bit here. Third and three. Let's keep an eye on number three in the green jersey here. This is the one I had starred, Kai, so maybe we're thinking about different plays, but I, I enjoyed watching uh, the tail end of this one. Maybe in, enjoyed is a, is a strong word, but. Third down, Dudek is the back. Quarterback wants to throw. Looking long, and that pass. Oh, man. Another one by Williams Lopez. Yeah, that was just one of those ones. Um, that you're in the right position, you think you have it, and I just, I just missed it. Um, again, one of those ones that goes down as a tackle, uh, but definitely should have been a PVU or maybe even an interception. 
Um, but I think good. I think either during the series there's a there's a timeout or after this series ends, um, we're sitting on the the bench, uh, kind of you know recapping or whatever. And Isaiah Swan, who's sitting next to me, just turns to me, looks me dead in the eye, and says, uh, you know, DJ Avery would have made that play because um, <laughs> uh, DJ had had gotten hurt earlier in the season. Um, and again, we try to have a you know a lot of guys playing, so it, it hurt us a little bit for him to be out. Um, but also, Swanee uh, kind of knew it would get under my skin quick and uh, get me fired up and ready to go. Um, as, he, <laughs> as he misses an open field tackle right there. Yeah. I, I think, uh, as you've probably heard a couple times now, we're we're not afraid to get under each other's skin uh, as players. And, you know, it, it, you, you can't have uh, too many feelings or, or not thin skin or else you're not going to last very long. Um, but that's how we get each other going, and it, it works. So. And Tyler, play it like that. You know, those are one of those players that he was in great coverage, great position. And that was a, it was a great throw, great catch. And you can live with those as a coach. I mean, you're going to – you know, that was our goal was to force – force Yale's offense to make great plays. And I tell that to the secondary all the time. Make them, make them have to make great plays. And it, you know, it, it's hard for a team to do that for four quarters. Um, you know, the thing you don't want to do is have busted coverages, not be in the right spot. Uh, mental lapses where that, that can cost you. But you know, really you know, put yourself in a position at least, you know, if you don't make the play, make them have to make a perfect one. Danny yeah, I don't think that's what Coach Mack told me during the game, though. <laughs> I think I told you it was good coverage. Probably bad call on my part. Sorry, guy. Yale, as they have most of the afternoon, uh, going without a huddle. All right, so we got we're back on our heels again, Tyler. It seems like. For me, it hasn't been a dominating Yale performance, despite what the scoreboard shows. It's just a, a few good plays when they've needed it, and here third and seven, they need another one. Yeah, I don't think it was ever we were. It was never a panic state. Honestly, they, they get us on this route right here. You know, this is something they pulled out. Honestly, you know, haven't seen that one before. We got a little mismatch. Um, you know, but uh, you know, it was nothing that we were panicking about because we knew everything that they were doing. We knew we could correct it. You know, and just got keeping guys settled. And our guys did a good job. Nobody panicked. Everybody stayed settled. And uh, once again, we just we knew we had to weather the storm. It's a perfectly placed ball. The only question was whether Dudek would be able. You're a special teams coach. Explain the uh, the purpose of what we're watching here from Yale, if you don't mind. Oh, they're doing. They, they they try to do like it's you know muddle huddle situation. What they're trying to do is you know check for numbers. If they feel like you don't, you're not aligned you know, to it correctly, if they feel like they got more numbers to one side. Um, they've got a couple plays they can run for a two-point play. Um, so obviously, and it's a, to me, it's another you know thing that a team will do to to make you have to work on it all week. They may never go for two, but it's something they're going to force you to have to spend time, um, you know, practicing and preparing for. We'll get to the 25, 26-yard line for Dart. All right, Coach Staff, twenty-one nothing. You've seen some opportunities that usually your offense would take advantage of. Anything to fire the guys up before they head out there? Any play call changes? Uh, what's the approach? You know, the main thing is just to keep the guys calm and, and know it's a long game. We're just halfway through the second quarter. Um, and, and we know that, you know, a team is not going to be able to do that to our defense the, for a whole game. And so we just got to stick to our game plan, maybe, maybe adjust here or there. Um, you know, in general, we're thinking, hey, we may have to throw the ball more um, and take advantage of that. But it, it definitely took us a minute to kind of adjust to what they were doing defensively. Uh, but the main thing is, is you know, to keep the players calm so they don't, they don't panic and think that, uh, you know, they're trying to get all 21 points, you know, in, in one drive, which is impossible. So, uh, you know, just got to keep them, keep them level-headed. And put Jared Gerbino in for a, a first, first down carry. Never a bad idea. Yeah, yeah, and this is this is early in Jared's career too. Um, you know, he had we didn't know what we quite we knew he had a good good talent. Um, you know, this was his first year playing in games, so we weren't sure how he, he was going to be in games. But uh, you know, quickly we found out. You know, he's a very competitive guy. Um, when the lights come on and it's game time, you know, he doesn't shy away from contact, the physical part of the game, and so. Uh, we knew we had someone special, and it's just a matter of, of grooming him and, and um, you know, putting him in a position to be successful and comfortable and do what he does best. 
Yeah, that was something that I think I really enjoyed about the offense was that every week when we came in, um, we honestly didn't really know what coach staff um, had kind of flipped up over, you know, the weekend. And so, uh, you know, one week we might run the ball you know, 20, 30 times with Turbino. And then the next week we might throw the ball, you know, 35 times and um, do it in the air. And so I think that was something that we were able to kind of adjust based off what the defense was showing us and the, the game plan. What is a two-yard loss? Smith will be the running back. How soon do you know? Quarterback. With, sorry, but how soon do you know when you're going to go with a Gerbino play or a Hennigan play? Is it based off of what happened to play before? Do you say, okay, let's go every other on this possession or something like that? Uh, it's not too much predetermined like that. Um, it, it's a lot of it's just off a of feel um, situation. Uh, there's certain plays that that Gerbino was running then, and certain plays that Jack was. There there are different quarterbacks at that stage of Jared's career and and Jack's career. Um, so it was, it was it was definitely off a of, of feel and and kind of the hot hand. Um, you know, Jack starts to heat up later in the game and. Um, you know, in some other games, you know, during that season, uh, Gerbino was, was playing really well. And, you know, what's great about these guys um, is that, you know, not only the quarterbacks, but anybody that was on that offense and on that team is very unselfish guys. And they knew that they weren't sure if their number was going to get called, but whether or not they were, they were ready for it and they encouraged and cheered on the other player um, and, and, you know, that was what set us apart, I felt like, where, you know, Drew, just like he said, he, he may get the ball a lot, he may not. And, uh, you know, either way, you didn't hear from him. He worked his butt off, and and uh, all the guys just, you know, took it in stride and knew that we were going to do what's best for the team and what's best for the offense each game. If I'm a defensive coordinator, once Gerbino started throwing play action touchdown passes, I throw my hands in the air and say, I don't know what you want me to do. That became a real weapon for you guys. Yeah, yeah. Each year, he, you know, we ended up throwing, we got more confidence in him and, and worked with him. And, and uh, you know, he only got better each year and uh, he threw the ball more every year and um, really developed nicely. And it's something that he was important to him and he spent a long time on and um, you know, he wanted to be that complete player and he didn't want to be seen as just, you know, a wildcat guy. Last series was Dartmouth's that last third down conversion on the pass play to Miller was Dartmouth's first conversion on third down in the game. A little bit of momentum here, but again, a long third down. And that's, that's tough for any offense, but there's signs it looks like that you guys have figured out how to move the ball a little bit better at this stage. Yeah, definitely a little bit better in this drive. Um, obviously not what we wanted completely, but, uh, you know, it's, you want to get some momentum. You want to get some confidence in the guys and, um, you know, getting close to halftime, you want to give them something to build on. Carlson, the free safety. How much pressure does the defense feel right now, Kai, knowing that there have been some highlights on, on the defensive end, but, you know, if Yale gets back in the end zone, it's going to be awfully tough for, you know, the, the offense to come all the way back. Um, I mean, honestly, I, I don't really know if we, we were ever really in panic mode. I don't think we were. Um, you know, I, for better or worse, we got used to playing in these types of games. Um, you know, it, it was unfortunate, but we, we got off to a slow start a lot this season. Um, but we were super confident that we had the ability to fight back every single time. Um, again, I think Coach Daft touched on it before that you – really the thing is you just can't try to do it all in, in one drop or one play. Um, you just got to take it one play at a time, do your job on that play, um, and just trust that everyone else is going to do their job, and little by little you're going to chip away. And I think the big thing, like Kai saying, you know, our, you know, our guys were really disciplined. You know, like he said, do your job. Because what happens sometimes, you fall behind, you become a little desperate you know, as players, and you try to start doing extra or do something different. And, you know, we, we really preach to our guys over and over, hey, take care of your job and trust the fact that 10 other guys are going to do their job. And I think that's just the culture we developed. Guys trusting each other. 
um, across the board, offensively, defensively, and special teams. We all trusted that each one of us were going to do our own job and do it the right way. And I think that was the reason we had success and had the ability to come back in this game is because the guys stayed on script. The guys did what they were supposed to do and didn't try to do something else and create even more issues. So. Um, hats off to the players that, uh, uh, that did that for us that year. I think that's Jackson Perry's little hobbled there, but uh, got him off the field. So we lost another key guy in this game. You know, once again, when you know, when Hagorn went out and then, and then Jackson went out, you know, they carted him off the field. Um, you know, guys didn't guys didn't pack panic and the next, next guy up. So we, you know, I think good thing is we have good depth. Uh, we had good depth, especially up front as a defensive line. And it gave another guy another chance and opportunity to get out there and perform. One on the tackle there for Dartmouth. On the run by Deshaun Salter, the 5'10", 250. Yeah, the theme of the first couple of weeks, we had Brendan Cascarano on the first Woods Watch party. He was talking about he wasn't a starter, but rotated in enough to get that feel for the game. And when he needed to, he was on the spot running to the ball to make a couple of big plays. And uh, – the defensive rotations, it seems to keep everybody fresh and able to able to come through when needed. And I think guys know that. They know that, you know, they're only going to be out there for eight, seven, eight plays. And so they can give 100 percent for eight plays. You know what I mean, as opposed to trying to pace themselves, if they know they're going to be out there for, you know, 12 to 15 plays, you know, they, they can give 100 percent knowing they're going to next guy's going to come in for them and, and give them give them an opportunity to get some rest. So Yale seems very content. The Swanee's pick on this drive. It will be Dartmouth football to start the second half. Big Green won the toss. Yeah, it's got to be coming up here soon. That was a huge play. Yeah. That's, that's what really changed the, the momentum. Rawlings is picked. There it is. And here comes Dartmouth with some momentum. This one we all realize he did have some decent speed at least right there. Interception for the Big Green. There you go, Swanee. That's what really got us got us going. Yeah, he just he's Swanee just this is a kind of the this is where Swanee showed that he had that that, that football savvy, you know, that instinct, that ability to, to be able to, to react and and uh, not guess, but you know, you make the right decision. And uh, he did a very good job of that obviously through the rest of his career. But, yeah, this was a huge play that kinda gave us a little little uh little put a little fire under us. Yeah, I think what Swan was always really good at is we talk a lot um, about not having wasted movement, especially as a DB, um, having clean breaks. I mean, you could see the break there, um, you know, puts his foot in the ground, creates a sharp angle and just, you know, knows exactly where to go. Um, and that's one of the things that made Swanee so good was that he didn't waste any movement. Um, and I think that's really why he shined throughout his career. Um, also, probably why we didn't think he was that fast for a long time because he didn't really need to run full speed. Um, but you know, he, he he does have a little bit of does have a little bit of speed. I believe that was Emory Thompson. I know you guys yeah. touched on a little bit about you know Emory last week, but you know, offensive guy and Drew is another guy. Um, we had you know we had a number of guys, uh, wide receivers, running backs who were on special teams. And uh, love being on it. And, uh, you know, we knew, regardless if you're a first teamer or if you're a first year guy, um, we were going to put the put the best players out on our special teams because it was a huge part of it. And in this game, it actually you can you can tell that, that, you know with the punts it, we flipped the field in the second half. Um, it seemed like this entire half we kind of were playing back on our half of the field. And you know we talk about it all the time about you know time you know, possession, you know, time possession and field position are the critical points in the game, and that's what we were able to do the second half is control those two parts of the game. Yeah, Coach Mack definitely emphasized the importance of special teams, and um, you know made it apparent you know coming in freshman year that if you want to get on the bus and you want to play. Um, yes, you can be good at your position, but if you can't contribute on special teams, it's going to be a lot more difficult um, for you to get out there. And so, and then a guy like Emery with as much juice as he has, um, he loved flying around. And I don't know how many career tackles he had, but he definitely had uh, quite a few, especially being a receiver. And then kind of going back to Swan, um, you know, my freshman year, I'd go against Vernon Harris, who I thought was you know, the best cornerback that I was ever going to face. And um, I didn't think that he could be replaced. And uh, Swan, you know, over the years, you see how far he progressed. And um, we knew that he was going to be a special player, especially going on one-on-ones and uh, making it very difficult for us receivers, you know, trying to look good in practice and, and work on our own craft. Tony Reno is trying to get his 
club. So the only bad thing about getting that interception going back and scoring so quick, we got to get right back out there now and give Yale with a, you know, a little bit of time here in the, uh, right before the half. You know, and obviously they're, they're, they're pushing it down the field. So There's Kai with a tackle. I mean, how aggressive are you here? Is this prevent right now? And then you lock it in once they get to field goal position, or are you just playing straight up? Uh, yeah, so we're in basically a, a two-minute drill um, as a defense. Uh, Coach McElwain tells us, you know, in a two-minute drill, the pressure's on the offense. Um, he really he really emphasizes that. So, you know, uh, uh, we're definitely in, a, you know, a two-minute situation, but we're still trying to remain calm. Again, just do your job every single play. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, we, we practice this all the time. Um, I believe it's it's either our Thursday or Friday practice. We have, uh, you know, a couple two-minute sessions, and that's actually some of the most fun parts of practice. Um, me and Bunch Strat and I know used to scream a little extra during those during those parts to, to make it a little bit more fun. Um, but again, it's something we practice. You just do your job um, and, and stay calm. And that's kind of our philosophy here, you know, defensively. You know, just to we want to make you. Know, we don't want to give up the big plays. And then you can tell we're starting to kind of get get a good feel we're starting to play a little bit better um force them to have to try to, to dink it down on us you know, a lot of offensive coaches don't have the patience to just tink the ball down the field and uh, once again to force them to have to make those perfect plays and then like the previous series force them to make mistakes as well and capitalize on that but you have to do when you send so many guys out yeah i've been thinking about isaiah swan and an nfl comp you can call me crazy you're the experts what about a Richard Sherman type where, sure, he's an athlete, but it's kind of the, the cerebral part of the game and the limited uh, motion, as you said, Kyron, that, that kind of sets him apart. That, that's the name that jumped out to me the first time I saw him play. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess he's also got the Dez going for him, so that helps a little bit too. With this that's probably it, yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, he he's just one of those guys, like I said, I, I he just – he just seems to never have a misstep, um, which is, I think, what makes him so great. And he was he was kind of that way from you know from a young young age came in. Um, I remember when he was a freshman, uh, he picked up the playbook incredibly fast. Um, you know, our freshmen, especially DPs, normally really struggle, which is why they need to play special teams to kind of get used to it. Um, but I do remember him just. It seemed like he just already knew it. Um, picked everything up on the first try. Um, and that's why he got to play a lot as a freshman, which definitely helped him later on. Here you go, JP. Good coverage, huh? Yeah, that was a great play. <laughs> yeah, even in practice, Swanee, I, you know, I would, I would coach the quarterbacks a little different when they say, hey, you know, you got Swanee on this side and, and, and someone else on this side. They would definitely be, have awareness of where he is and, and what he's doing, and uh, just know that he has a, an extra sense of, to know where the ball's going. He just had that knack. He did. Took a swipe and uh, managed to knock it away. Nice play there by You won about every award you could possibly win, All-American, Defensive Back of the Year. I mean, the, the trophy case is full for Isaiah Swan, and he's uh, made the big play to get you guys back in it toward the end of the half. He's get to the yeah, right here we just we got we got to force a field goal. We can't allow these guys to put seven on us here. You know, so we feel like we can force them to kick this field goal. It's you know we feel like this you know, it's a win for us. A young Lelos in there. Yeah. Kick on the way and the kick is good. Three points more for Yale. On the well, as time expires in the second quarter, Yale does get that field goal, but a good stand from Dartmouth to keep it to just three. The pick from Isaiah Swan has the big green on the comeback and we'll be back to start the third quarter right after this there are lots of things that are true about each of us but sometimes we are held back from being ourselves sometimes we are told we can't do a certain thing because we're a boy or a girl but it's okay to be who we are Girls can be messy and boys can be neat. Girls can be fast and boys can be creative. It's good for both boys and girls to talk about their feelings and to clean up their messes. It's okay for all of us to be scared, brave, loud, quiet, gentle, and smart. And it's always good to ask for help when we need it. We get to decide who we want to be and how we want to spend our time. All that matters is we are genuine and no one is getting hurt. I'll support you in being yourself and I hope that you'll support me.
All right, third quarter. It is 24-7, the Big Green trailing, but they're going to get the ball back to begin the second half. Coaches, tell us what happened in the locker room. Uh, Coach Mack, we'll start with you and your units, who you were giving uh, adjustments to, and then maybe the collective uh, entire uh, team meeting and team speech as you headed back onto the field. What was the, the locker room like, Coach Mack? It was, you know, we, we, you know, we made sure that everybody, you know, and everybody was calm and everybody was understanding that hey, this is a situation we're in and we panicked. Um, you know, uh, we've done a good, we do a good job as a team um, at halftime on all sides, both sides of the ball, making corrections. So, you know, we can get a feel of what an offense was doing, trying what Yale's offense was trying to do to us. And obviously we break that down and figure it out and, and you know, figure out what's going to be the best thing to do to, to you know, to, to attack it in the second half. And uh, you know, we do a lot of communication with our players. Our players give us a lot of feedback. And you know, tell us what they see out there on the field and, and, and recommendations and suggestions. And so, but yeah, nobody wants to, you know, it doesn't do any good to holler and yell because there was nothing, it wasn't the effort. You know, they, they were making good plays on their side of the ball, but we felt comfortable enough that we were going to be able to go out there and, and uh, do what we need to do to, to get ourselves back in this game. You can pretty much use anything you yeah, want same thing on our side. I know, uh, I know. I remember Coach Stevens got into Jack pretty good for good reason. He was he was just a little off throwing and that sort of thing. And and uh, you know that's what I loved about Jack. He could coach him hard and he responded. Um, he didn't go into a shell, didn't pout. Um, you know, he just he rose to the challenge. So, um, but uh, you know, like Coach Max said, you know, in the locker room. You know, whether it be an offense or defensive guy, whoever, you know, whichever side of the ball is playing better, you know, the guys are all in it together and uh, they're encouraging and they're not pointing the finger and anything like that. So um, that's what's what's great to be around is, is those types of players. It makes your job easier. It's one less thing to worry about. This is kind of, this is a big play by by Dylan. We started to get him and he ended up having a, a big game, but this is one of a, you know, a third down play against man coverage. He made a big play and you know drew knows you know at that wide receiver position you start to get a catch or two you start to you start to feel it and uh you know you start to, to play better with a lot more confidence and um getting those guys involved was big yeah, i think something um at halftime that we discussed was uh, we were kind of adjusting our positions with hunter going down it was more difficult to do on the fly but at halftime um, we all kind of switched around just because we were going in with a new game plan and um, i think that that was something that yeah like coach staff said dylan stepped into that role really well and kind of got us the momentum that we needed to um spark a comeback yeah, because Dylan, Dylan um, at that point was probably the, the fourth guy with that group. And, and with Hunter going down, he became the third guy, which, you know, gets you in the game a significant amount more time. So, um, you know, I was, I was happy for him and for Drew. They ended up playing really well. Back to back big pass plays. A couple of. This might be your play right here coming up here, Drew. To Dylan Miller and a 26 yarder to Ryder Stone to set up what was a first down of the 30. Yeah, one thing about this play is um, that nickel, he was a very physical player. And so I knew that if I could get his hands off me, that Jack would be able to, you know, throw a perfect ball like that. I mean, I think that the route was good, but the throw was what made the play. Um, he laid it right over my shoulder. Um, and, but after scoring, I also remember that thinking, hey, we're still down by a lot of points. There's still a lot to go. Um, so, of course, you know, you're happy about scoring, but kind of on to the next play at this point. But, a, but, you know, that drive right there, that's a confidence builder. You know, being on the sideline and as a defensive group, you watch your offense march it down there and strike and attack. And you can come out of the half and, and put points up that quick. And so we knew as a defense that, hey, this, this is a whole new ball game. Uh, we need to go out there and, and, and shut these guys down in the second half to give our offense an opportunity, you know, to, to catch them and pass them. Assignment still on the Dartmouth defense here. Drew, it looked like you barely got your head around on that throw. It's so perfectly placed. Did you have a chance to even track it through the air? Or is that just perfect timing and you and your quarterback being in sync? Yeah, I think that um, I kind of expected Jack to put it where it needed to be. And so my main focus was um, getting the Nichols hands off and then stacking him to make sure that I could give Jack plenty of room to, to throw it. 
Um, and so I remember, yeah, quickly looking up and being like, oh, okay, this is right here. Um, we're going to be fine on this one. All right, so that, that Coach T halftime speech worked on QBJ. I mean, he's firing him in there perfectly. So good signs for the comeback attempt here. Yeah, just like Coach Max said, you know, coming out of half when you're down like that, to, uh, that first drive is important. It kind of sets the tone and, you know, gets us back into it emotionally. And so it was, it was a big deal. And we knew as a, we knew as a team we had to chip away. Like you know, guys said in the first half, you're not going to get all points in one play. Um, you just got to you know keep chipping away, keep chipping away at it, you know, and take one play at a time. You talked about coachability for not just Jack Hennigan, but I'm sure a lot of these guys. Are you able to pick up on those traits during recruiting meetings? Do you do you look for that? It kind of seems like something that you're not going to find out if they're coachable or not until you get them on campus and really have to get down to it and try to get them to be better. Is it, how, how do you find guys who are going to be coachable? Yeah, definitely. I, I think you can find signs of it in the recruiting process. Um, hopefully, if you can get them on campus or see them in a camp, I think that's big. You can coach a drill that they're in um, or watch a drill, and you kind of see how they respond to, to some of the coaching. You know, do they do they, do they look the coach in his eye and, um, you know, do something different, or, or they kind of just – push it off to the side. And so you're looking at body language and how guys respond to that. Um, and so you'll get a little bit of that in recruiting. You can talk to some of the high school coaches and, and find out there. Um, but then once you actually get them on campus and you're coaching them on a day in basis, um, you see them go through some adversity. Um, you see them in the, in the heat of the game and, and you start to, to see what it's like and see how they do respond. Um, and I'm, I'm a believer you can coach them through that. Um, there's some of those things that guys just have it in them. Um, and then, you know, which Jack does and, and Drew definitely does. And there's other guys you got to, you got to coach it out of them. You got to talk to them about it and, expectations and, and what you need out of them. And I also think too, when like Kevin was saying, when guys get here on campus, our older players do a phenomenal job. You know, they set the bar high and uh, the young guys look up to those older guys and, and, and they'll, you know, they, they see how the older guys handle coaching. And our older guys do a really good job of pulling those young guys aside and say, hey, you know, coach might've got on you, but this is why he's doing it. You know, it's gonna get better. And, uh, but our older guys just do such a great job of taking those guys under their wings and, and really teaching them. And, and they'll hold them accountable, too. If, if guys are not doing what they're supposed to be doing, you know, we've, got, you know, we've got it where this program is where coaches don't have to be the ones that call guys out. You know, other guys will call guys out, and, and their expectation level is, is, is very high, and they're expecting those guys to live up to that. On it in a pickup of... Three yeah, Kyle, last week, one of your uh, co-tri captains, Jeremiah Duche, was saying it's really more of a, a leadership committee in addition to the three captains. And, I mean, you've probably had questions like this before, but it really is so impressive. The 12th player in program history to be captain for more than one year, multiple-time winner of the Reggie Williams Award. Uh, so, I mean, what does it mean to you to be a two-year captain, to have the confidence of your teammates, especially on defense? So many talented guys. We talked about this last week, but for you to be chosen among that great group, it's, it's got to mean a lot. Yeah, I mean, um, being chosen as, as a captain amongst this group of guys, um, you know, it was extremely humbling, um, especially, like, amongst the class that you came in with. You formed such a tight bond with your class. Um, that's something that's really special. Um, and also, you know, everyone is a leader on the team. Um, we have some really, really amazing leaders. Um, especially, like, you know, guys like Ryder, um, who was an amazing leader, who wasn't a captain. Um, you know, it's it's just something that's, that was really, really special for me. Um, also, uh, I know, like, this year I was coming back from an injury, so I hadn't even been a full-time starter yet. Um, so to be elected as a captain, um, considering that was, uh, was a little crazy for me as well. Um, and, but again, it, it's easy to lead guys that are, that want to do the, that are all wanting to do the right thing. Everyone wants to win. Everyone wants to win the right way. Um, you know, so it, it was, it was an, an extreme, extreme honor, um, that I, I am incredibly thankful for. Yeah. Something about Kai that I've, you know, immediately noticed, um, is, you know, sometimes you have captain that are more of the vocal leaders um, that are you know, more of the raw raw type guys and then the, there are other captains that 
you know, kind of lead by example. And Kai was one of those people that, that did it both. And, um, you know, being a, a more reserved person and not being more of a rah-rah guy, it kind of inspired me and I know other people to not only, you know, lead by example, but also um, be a vocal leader. And um, he, it just always seems like he had the right things to say at the right times. And um, it definitely got everybody going. Pick up to the 11 yard line, a gain of 18. And here's Yale. Right Another back spot, Coach Mack, where you got to hold him to three. At least that's how it feels right now. Yeah, we had a couple of times there. We had him a third down. We just we got to get him off the field. Um, but uh, yeah, we definitely got it. We know right now this situation here, you know, we, we, we've got to force him to three. Down to the eight yard line. And how much pressure for a guy in your position do you feel? I'm guessing it's not that much. You have faith in your guys, but you're in charge of the secondary and on special teams. And usually in the NFL, if something goes wrong with those units, they put the coach right on camera, even if it's not your fault. So I wonder if you, you feel added pressure when uh, it's your particular unit out there. Yeah, I mean, I just, you know, that's what you sign up for. You know what I mean? You want your guy, you know, you want to be in that situation, just like our players. They want to be, they want to be the guy out there that has to make the play. And uh, you know, it's, it's, it's only pressure if you allow it to be pressure. Um, and, uh, but no, it's, you, you, but you prepare yourself. That's the thing. You, if, if you do what you're supposed to be doing and you prepare yourself, um, and you put yourself out there and you're ready, it shouldn't be pressure. You know what I mean? But, uh, but our guys, like I said, you know, we, you know, our guys do a really good job uh, down the red zone. Uh, once again, they're very disciplined in those situations, and they're, they put themselves in the spots they're supposed to be, and, and uh, they give us a chance. And that's, all, that's all we're asking for. Bounce out to the right now, goes end zone. Is he inbound? No, out of bounds. We're still crying about this play. Who did make the catch. What is he pointing at here? What's 46 pointing at? Uh, I believe he's pointing at the scoreboard. Big screen. He wants to look at the big screen. Really on the field, incomplete pass. He was out. Down. It'll be fourth down. There's no challenge available. I will say one of my favorite catches of the day is an out-of-bounds catch from Drew a little bit later on. I mean, I, I impressive snag by him there to, to get that, but uh, – you figured they'd be okay with a field goal the way their offenses look. They probably figured they'll be back in the red zone, but uh, might not be the case. Yeah, this is big holding them to a field goal right here. You know, if they answer our touchdown with a touchdown. And, and I think also before the half, uh, Tyler, I meant to mention, I don't know if you guys remember this, Kai, but, you know, there was a timeout. I think it was actually when uh, uh, there was an injury on the field. I think when, uh, Jackson was hurt on the field. Uh, and they were – they were over there in a group and they were kind of dancing and celebrating to the music. And we kind of used that as a little bit of a motivator at halftime that, Hey, these guys, they think this game's over. I said, they're, you know, you know, we're telling them, Hey, you know, some of our players saw the guys are dancing. You know, they think the game's over. So I think it kind of, you know, woke our guys up a little bit and, and they were ready to come out in the second half. At the point. He has two nicknames. He stands out. Yeah, I, I remember that. Um, and then I, I also remember I feel like that that example was used also for times uh, when we were up in games um, to keep guys focused as well. Um, again, just like making sure that everything is, is in check, body language, um, staying locked in. Um, but, yeah, I, I do definitely remember that, uh, the, the little bit of a dance going on when uh, Jackson went down. Hennigan wants to throw. He's going long downfield for Honeycutt, and he couldn't make the one-handed catch. Yells Spencer Imashevsky. That was one of those plays that I remember uh, thinking that would have been probably the best catch of my career, and um, it definitely was. I could have made it, and not coming down with it definitely gave me a little bit of extra fire for the next few plays. The captain of this team, despite the fact that he missed all of last year. That feels like year. since that touchdown – you're becoming, becoming one of uh, Hennigan's favorite targets here. Not that he was looking you off earlier, but a lot more action coming your way here in the second half. Quarterback will keep it here, and Hennigan will get to the 20. Nice job by Jack right there, getting some yardage. Like Kai said before, he's a little, he's a little sneaky, a little sneaky with his athleticism, but he does a nice job, you know. Real sneaky. Downs today, it's Yale 27. <laughs> Dartmouth 14. I always felt like Three, watching these games, half, maybe the zero to 60 isn't elite, but Yale. once he does get to that max velocity, he's really moving out there. And that makes a big difference in the open field, as you guys know. And he's a big kid. He's a strong kid. 
I mean, you, you see, you'll see guys bounce off them. You know, it's just, it's very deceptive. Man in motion is Joseph Cook. He sets on the left side. Pressure coming. Hennigan hit as he threw it. And the ball Ooh. winds up. There it is. That's, that's, that's the favorite. That's the best catch I saw in the video. That was that was something else out of bounds, though. Man, I don't know how he got the ball to Hunting. Yeah, I remember um, watching that one and seeing how much pressure Jack was under. And for him to throw a ball that I think if you put it anywhere else, um, that DB might have a chance. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't get a, a foot down for that. But. Um, Jack definitely stood in there well. Yeah, he, he never shied away from, from contact, which, which was great. He never got happy. Here's the last one. I'm not going to throw any names out there. <laughs> well, the box score says uh, false start number three on green. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna publicly say it right here. It was not his fault. <laughs> I'd love to hear the breakdown. First of all, love the call. Looked like it would have worked perfectly. Uh, we have to break it all down for us. This was a fascinating moment. Yeah, we just—it was the timing. To, uh, you know, we didn't allow the shift to happen. Um, you know, what we were trying to do here. Um, so it was just it, it was ball was snapped before it was supposed to be snapped. But yeah, we had a shot. We had a chance there. You know, we knew we, had, we were trying to make something happen. Um, we felt like we, we had a situation where we could capitalize on it. But once again, I mean, Davis does a great job here. And this was the whole idea. Even though we had to punt, if we could just flip the field and continuously keep working them back, make them have to work the entire field against us defensively, we feel like, hey, defensively, we started getting where right, we're feeling better what we're doing. You know, we're putting ourselves in good situations. Let's get them three and out. Now we can start giving our offense the ball more at midfield. And now we can we can flip this field in the second half. Holy Cross and Yale will get together next Saturday. How long do you think you have to make that decision? Punt or go for it? What what's the the stopwatch in your head where you got to make the call by? Columbia squad that is now You talking about in a situation at the end of the game? Exactly. Yeah. How quickly do you have to make that call? Is it right after the third down doesn't go your way? Just like immediately, like. All the way down to the dark. I guess so, right? Before he's brought yeah. Down I mean, yeah. I think, yeah, you got to make that decision pretty quick. Yeah. And it just depends on what the, what the situation of the game is at, too. And takes it all the way to the dark with 44. A good, uh, good effort play by Colin. It's the first half of how back up. On the run for the first Made it the second time. Dudek, he's already been an Ivy League rookie of the week once this year. Dudek again. And he's not going anywhere this time. Jack Trainer put the first hit on him, and it's only a one-yard. Had a pretty good, uh, almost a two-headed monster at the the running back position too. I know we talked a lot about the the quarterback and the receivers, but similar to the Big Green offense, he wasn't exactly a go-to guy every time they were going to run. So it seems like you're finally uh, starting to slow him down a bit. Yeah, I mean they were able to, you know, they had good, you know, a couple backs that they could stay fresh. You know, the situation, they're, they're in a perfect situation, right? With their lead and the ball midfield, you know, they, they can run, run or throw the ball. You know, so it makes it very difficult defensively to try to defend at all time. But our guys did a great job up front here. You know, we could, you know, four-man rush and, and still be able to stop the run. It makes it easy for us in the back seven. And this helps, too. Well, they've had a couple of other... I recall, I think there were a couple penalties on, on them that it, it didn't help them in this second half. It definitely helped us out a bunch. No third down. But declined anyway. I think it's going to wind up being third and seven. So another third down situation where Yale's been able to convert a good chunk of the time, at least in the first half. So yeah. good play here. We know, we know this is a big down for us here. Instead, he'd rather have the down. And it'll be third down and seven from the 41 yard line. Yeah, this is that area too. You know, if they get half of it, they might go for it on fourth down. So, so here's you, know, you want a four second incompletion in this spot. Five receivers again. Rawlings takes the football, looking for something to develop, and he's going to be run oh, down from play. behind. That's a sack. Is that TJ? Young for TJ. Nine. Go to Merrick. Big play for the big green defensively. You guys call that a coverage sack, or you give credit more to the defensive end? Uh, we'll give that to TJ. I think that might have been the first one. 
No, it was a good combination. I mean, Dartmouth we, having to get to a few players did a good in job of matching up coverage wise and you know, allow, you know, we have some guys up front who could you know, give them a little time. They, they can make a move and get there quick. But they didn't snap the football, so everybody is set. Big Green will get it back here down by 13 in the third quarter. I think this might have been one that we get pinned down. And out of bounds it goes. Let's see where yeah, they're going to mark. Inside the five. First down and 10. For Dartmouth and Jack Hennigan from his eight yard line. It, it says a uh, personal foul on uh, Drew Honeycutt in the box score. The uh, cameras and did not catch whatever it might have been. Coming out, man. No, I don't remember that one. No. First down. <laughs> not Drew. Vito. Yeah, I wouldn't think so either. Well, this first yeah, I'm trying to remember who that was. I think it was on the sideline. I think it was a late push out of bounds. On the ground this is a nice job by Vito. He kind of got bumped around on his route, he fought through it. Jack made a nice throw to him, so it's always nice to get Jack that shit in the pocket. Just yeah. down to, uh, just no panic. On the, uh, -yard line, the That's big, though. Anytime you're inside your five, you can get that thing out there right away. Unnecessary roughness. Offense, number 83. 15 it's like he's coming back, though. I'm trying to remember what this one was for. Kill Commons. We'll snap the football. Hennigan waiting. Pressure develops. He looks downfield and has his man in stride for another Dartmouth first down. A big play by Dylan. Dylan yeah, this was a little bit of it. it improvising it here. He kind of got cut off on, yeah, on a slant route. And pretty much all those two guys just making a play. There from Hennigan. So pick up of 19 and a dark the last penalty down. was actually the personal foul, apparently, nice that the cameras did not catch. It wasn't on the kickoff, my mistake, or the punt, rather. Uh, was that the crash back through? Yeah, that's what it was. Totally legal. <laughs> they wanted this one bad, too, but... Yeah, he's, I remember this. He's following this one. Yeah, he's definitely yeah, it was a bad read by, by Jack on that one. He would have liked to have that one back, too. I kind of saw the bobble there as he went out of bounds. You'll see the ball kind of pop up into the air. Right there. Emory made a really good play there, making sure that, you know, that was a, you know, contested catch, which... You know, even that little swipe at the face might have been the reason why um, he didn't come down with that. I always thought Emery could have made a made a good corner if he if he had decided to come over to the dark side, but uh, you guys convinced him to stay over there. And here comes another one. Yeah, I brought that up many times in the staff meeting. <laughs> Drew's fired up there on those flags. Yeah, he's getting a little battle with uh, 23. That guy was a good player. I think he ended up getting drafted, and but. Uh, Drew did a great job, you know. He is holding you. They call holding or PI on that one. Um, I think it was PI. I remember um, seeing that ball thrown, and I was like, I, I just don't think that I'll be able to get to that one. But he also wasn't turning his head, and so my thought was, I'm just going to go right through him and make it as apparent as possible that that was pass interference. And um, I think after that play, it kind of um, – made me think of doing that you know much more in my career after that which definitely came in handy on those ones where you know it's going to be a tough catch and they wind up accepting the roughing the passer penalty but terrific play by you just for good measure to to get that pi especially on second and ten if that's incomplete or you don't get a penalty it's uh, real tough to keep the ball moving here as they try to rally from down 21 nothing against yale Within 13 at the moment, 27-14. It was the freshman John Dean call for roughing the passer. First down and 10. Stone in the backfield. Hennigan wants to throw wide open. Caught by Demery Thompson out of bounds. I haven't seen too much Durbino lately, Hit Coach Daft. Uh, seems like Hennigan's giving you the confidence to, at least for now, just ride with him. He's throwing darts out there. Yeah, yeah. This is, uh, we put Durbino, you can see him right there. He's going to be at receiver. So, you know, that's something we had always wanted to do and, and, and uh, you know, early in his career, um, but yeah, like I said, he was a little dinged, and um, he still played through it. Uh, it was a nice job by by Jack right there on the run. Um, and then yeah, Drubino didn't end up playing the next game, but uh, 
ball to the 38 you know, and a gain of he's six. usually a gamer. He, you know, he, he had some untimely things in his career, but he ended up, he Try showed up game time, you know, that are no matter what. Starting to rack up those first downs, too. And again, a nine the first game, like, there was a span of five or six games where I don't think that he actually practiced once, but when it came down to the game, um, he suited up and would probably go for you know, multiple touchdowns and over 100 rushing yards. It's a good job in this series here, like multiple guys touching this ball. Darvin scrambling to get essentially almost every wide outs touched it, running backs to touched it, to do Vito, tight ends touched it. Steven Johnston, so we, we, the tight end. Definitely got the Yale defense having to cover everybody. Two receptions for Smith today. He'll try to run Smith up the middle, tried to spin his way out of a tackle, but just a yard there for Miles Smith, and that winds up being the final play of the third quarter. So Dartmouth, who had punts and the first six drives of the game, is figuring it out here in the second half. Another deep drive into Yale territory as we head to the fourth on the Woods Watch Party Week 3. Stay tuned. Growing your business isn't just one thing. It's a million little things. Should you lease, rent, or own? How fast can you get that part? Does it fit the budget? That's what your local cap is here for. With expert advice, flexible financing, and industry-leading equipment, you can get the job done day after day. For a limited time at Milton Cat, get 0% for 60 months on select new Cat Compact equipment. As a trusted choice firm, the Richards Group has been committed to local communities for decades. We take the time to get to know our clients, their needs, and budget. We're independent, so we work for you, not an insurance company. We use our expertise to find our clients the best home, auto, and business coverage at the most competitive price. Our team provides consulting services for employee benefits, retirement plans, human resources, and leadership development. The Richards Group. Prepare for tomorrow by contacting us today. We are on to the fourth quarter, and what was once a 21-0 deficit at home for homecoming for the Big Green has been narrowed down quite a bit, but still a lot of work to be done for the Big Green as they're driving deep into Yale territory. Let's rejoin the action as Jack Hennigan is still under center, looking to continue this drive. Another nice diving play from Drew Honeycutt. You've been one of the stars in this game. We saw a 30-yard touchdown earlier. And I haven't mentioned yet, but you're a semifinalist for the Campbell Trophy, honoring the top student athletes in the country. You're another success story, and I want to hear from Kai as well, being able to handle the academic workload and excelling on the football field. It's, it's a challenge you were able to rise to, and I wonder how much that was a factor in your decision to come to Dartmouth, and uh, it, it seems to have worked out great for you. Yeah, I was honored to um, be nominated for that award, and I think it just speaks to, you know, how Dartmouth football is able to let you succeed not only on the field but off the field. Um, I think it, it really does start with the players, and as we mentioned earlier with the older guys, is, um, you know, I think managing football in school at any um, – with any program is going to be difficult, but having the older guys take you under their wing and, and make sure, you know, you know, these are the classes that you should be taking. Um, this is how you should structure your time. Um, and then also the coaches um, allowing us to be able to you know, put school first, um, but still be able to do the things that we need to do um, for, for football. I think Coach Stevens is one of those guys that, you know, he preaches that, Yes, you're here for four years, but, um, you know, this school is going to get you to where you're going to be in 40 years. And so um, that was something that, you know, made me at ease going to an Ivy League school and then also playing football at the same time. Uh, yeah, and uh, same thing for me. Um, so I, I studied engineering. And I, at most places, uh, especially at the Division One level, um, you're just not allowed to be an engineer and a football player. Um, it's just at most places that's a, that's a cold – cut fact if you you know you got to choose between the two um but i think you know uh, over the years we had always over 10 engineers on the team at a given time uh, typically you know up towards 15 or even more um and again uh drew touched on it but um having the older guys help you out um for me i had you know vernon harris dave morrison 
Williams, um, Lopez, you know, our uh, second, <laughs> Cook, Darius, uh, live with those guys. Um, and Flo helped me with some other non intuitive classes. Um, but, you know, they're, they'll sit down with me. And they would sit down with me and say, okay, this class, take it in the winter. Um, it's a lab you need to take in the afternoon. Um, and just going through the schedule with me was super helpful. And then uh, Coach T really prioritizes academics. Um, even this season, um, I actually had a class I needed to use for graduation. Um, and so, uh, you know, I had to miss some meetings sometimes. So I would come in with Coach Mack uh, earlier in the day, um, go through our special teams meeting, um, and then go to my class and, you know, make it back for practice and, and the end of meetings. Um, but again, that just doesn't happen anywhere else. Um, and it's not something that we just say, um, you know, Coach T is, is very much set on following through on what he believes. Back of the end zone there and put neither foot. Yeah. I got him one in. Turbino back in. He, he had actually caught that. I mean, about that. Of an ESPN if he had his foot in. Yeah. I've noticed that route a lot, Thompson in the back corner of the end zone. That seems to be – is that a favorite play of yours, Coach Taft, or am I just seeing things? Uh, yeah, I think he, I was watching the other broadcast, and uh, he caught a touchdown that same spot against Holy Cross. Uh, but a little bit of coincidence. I mean, Jack tried to take a shot with him on the outside. Just a little wide on, on that one and uh, not a lot of room. But, uh, yeah, great catch. Clock running here in the fourth quarter. Yale 27, Dartmouth 14. Yeah, you see there, uh, Tyler, there's a great, you know, great shot of our crowd. We had a you know, great crowd for this game, um, homecoming game. Um, you know, one of the reasons uh, you know, we have a program called the Mentor Program that uh, Drew and, and I are well aware of, where we have a lot of individuals, you know, local um, business owners, professors in the area. And what we do is we assign these uh, mentors with incoming freshmen. And it's kind of a you know family away from a family. It allows them an opportunity to, to meet local people and people that are in the Hanover area and, and help with the adjustment um, to the area. And, and Drew and Kai could probably speak on it, but they, you know, their family develops this relationship with these mentors and, and they'll have them for the rest of their life. And it's been a great program that Coach Stevens brought to Dartmouth. And uh, you know, a lot of the people in those stands are individuals who uh, they're mentors and, and they have the ability to come watch their, their guys play and, and their kids have an opportunity to be around these guys who are great role models. Yeah, um, touching on the, the mentor program, um, my mentor's family was especially um, something that really helped my parents get comfortable with, with me being so far. Um, you know, any time that they wanted to come to a game, um, they were going to make sure that they had the best time, whether it was, you know, going to their tailgate at halftime or just spending time and showing um, my family the Upper Valley. And, and still to this day, we um, text and call and uh, the Bachmans. I, I think that a lot of my best friends were also their mentees. Um, and so, you know, we'd all like go and hang out together. And it was really cool to see someone, um, you know, the family take us under their wing when they really didn't, you know, need to do that. Um, just because they loved the school and um, they loved Army football. Yeah, and then um, for me, uh, my uh, my mentor actually uh, had moved away right after my freshman year, but later on in my career, uh, another uh, football alum, uh, Dave Harrison, ended up becoming uh, very much a, a mentor to me, um, and I think a lot of the other guys as well. Um, you know, he, you know, whether it was just having a place to get a home cooked meal, um, you know, someone that you see, you know, in town or on campus. Um, that's just a familiar face outside the football team. It just makes you feel a little bit more like you're at home. Um, and so that, again, it's it's just, again, adding more of that family element, which is just so prevalent in our, in our football program. So the ball back to the 11-yard line, second down. And, Drew, did I hear that you're now working in Houston at a company that's essentially all Dartmouth uh, folks all the time? Let's see. Yep, so it's called the Hanover Company. Um, it was founded by a Dartmouth grad, the CEO, COO, our Dartmouth grads. A lot of people in my capital markets group are. Um, and so it's really cool to be able to, you know, follow Dartmouth football and to be able to talk about our times at Dartmouth. Um, and the mentor program was especially important in helping me get there. Um, my wide receivers coach senior year, um, wrote a recommendation letter. He was good friends with 
the founder of the Hanover Company, um, which, you know, really helped me get my foot in the door and, and be where I am today. And we actually just hired on a Hunter Hagdorn I think two weeks ago. So um, we are keeping the, the big green pipeline strong at the Hanover Company. That reminds me to ask. Drew Estrada, What's, is the Argyle, Texas thing a coincidence or are you guys a combo deal? I would like to say that Drew Estrada is once Dartmouth because of me. Um, uh, but all jokes aside, I mean, he was, I think he was committed to Penn or was very, you know, leaning towards there heavily. Um, and he came up for a visit and, uh, you know, I was like, hey, man, like, this place is really special. Um, you've got someone that, you know, has kind of been in your shoes coming from Texas, coming from a small town in Argyle. Um, this is where you need to be. Um, and, you know, still to this day, I mean, he just was here uh, uh, sleeping on our couch for a three-month internship here in Houston, um, who was actually, he helped, he was able to get that through a 97 uh, Dartmouth football player. So, um, you know, I'd like to say that I, I did a lot getting them here, but it was really just um, the coaches and the players and just Dartmouth football itself. Nice return by McManus. Down That's one thing too, Tyler, you know, we recruit the entire nation. Um, so you're going to have, our, our team is full of guys from all over the country, you know, Hawaii, all the way to Canada. Um, and that's the one thing these guys were able to do is build those relationships with, with guys that are from all different parts of the country and, uh, and then continue those relationships and that networking, building that network. And, you know, Kai, you can talk about a little bit after you were done playing your experience uh, going overseas. And now the eight. Yeah, so um, I actually uh, this past year spent uh, the year in England uh, continuing to play football. I was over there with Rafa Deleo and Jack Anderson. Um, so we um, got set up to go to uh, grad school, actually. So we had uh, postgraduate scholarships. Um, we got uh, master's degrees in business. Um, and, you know, for me personally, um, I didn't get to do an exchange program at Dartmouth, which was one of my biggest regrets because we are one of the few Division One football programs that not only allows but encourages players to do that. Um, so for me, it was an opportunity to go overseas, uh, live in a different country, um, and it was just awesome. Um, it was great having some some teammates out there as well. We had a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's again just going to Dartmouth and it just opened my eyes up to so many things that I wouldn't have even thought was possible um, before actually doing it. Um, and, and again, to get to do it with with teammates and friends um, was awesome. So got a got a lot of you know. Fun memories from the year over there. Dartmouth shifting in personnel. Yale responding with five new players. It's also a regret of mine to not go study abroad. And it was something more of a personal choice of why I didn't go. Um, I definitely had the, the option to go. Um, and I hope you guys at the Woods Watch Party have someone that um, was able to go because every person that's ever been has you know, said very high praises of that experience and uh, just like Kai, I I think that I, I missed out by by not doing that, but it was an opportunity for me to pursue if I wanted to. I think uh, Estrada went to Spain, right? Yeah, Estrada was somebody that, um, you know, I think not only did he get a great academic experience, but he was able to meet some people that he might not come um, across paths with, and um, he still talks to a lot of those people. I think that you form a pretty special bond when you spend a, a whole term overseas, uh, you know, especially learning a new language and being in class together all the time. And so, yeah, if Estrada is, is on here, he, he definitely can speak more to it, but he speaks very highly of it. And then I think, um, I think Danny McManus and Charlie Miller and maybe Port Anko went to New Zealand together for a term as well. Um, they had a bunch of fun, um, and so, so again, yeah, there's a bunch of guys who have done it. Everyone has absolutely loved it. Um, and obviously, you know, we're talking about a lot of these guys who are, you know, some of the best players that had some of the most productive careers. Um, so when I say, you know, it, it, it can be done, it, it, it most definitely can be and should be. Yeah, I remember it was surprising because when I first, uh, first got to Dartmouth, uh, they're like, yeah, the guy, the starting quarterback, I was like, oh, can I meet him? And they're like, oh, he's in England. I'm like, he's in England. What's he doing over there? 
and uh, he was over there doing the study abroad, yeah, taking classes, right, yeah. and so we connected. This but uh, yeah, definitely unusual. One of the few, if only, so schools that you can do Yale that and still play football. Buys you a little bit of extra That's great because you don't have to sacrifice things. You know, like Kai said, these guys were over in Sydney, Australia. Um, but once again, you know, but still at the same time, while they're there taking classes, Spencer Brown does a phenomenal job of providing a, a location and workouts for our guys when they are abroad. And so missing out on anything. And so when they come back, they're just as ready to go as if they were on campus. And like Kai said, every one of these guys who study abroad, you know, they're, they're, they're big time players for us. So they're not sacrificing anything. So it's a, it's a great benefit. Yeah, and even uh, more guys, I think what, uh, was it McGriff and Nigel went down to Brazil for for a term as well? Um, I mean, Caskey was in France. Talking about you know Caskey in France, QBJ in uh, in England, and Charlie Miller in New Zealand. Those are three guys that all played uh, in the NFL. Um, Caskey's still with the uh, with the Panthers, um, and that is I mean that's that's Dartmouth football for you right there. Um, being able to do these things that you know normal college students might not be able to get to do um but to do that and play division one football at such a high level that you get to continue playing professionally um that's just like i mean it, it seems like it's a lie when you say it out loud even when i say it now it sounds ridiculous um but it's it's true and going back to you know having friends all over the country uh i actually spent my winter breaks in hawaii with two of my best friends on the team of Boone, Stratton, and Kamana Hobbs. Um, and a lot of us uh, in our you know, friend group would, would go out there and spend a week um, with them. And that's just something that's very special that, you know, I have great friends in, in Boston, New York, Florida, Hawaii. Um, and, and we do, you know, plan trips to go see each other because why would you not uh, go to all these really cool places um, with, you know, the people that you enjoy spending time with. So, um, it, it's pretty cool to see uh, where your your friendship friendships are from. And in the meantime, guys, this defense has turned things way up. We're heading towards crunch time. That was the second straight three and out forced by the defense. And I'm wondering how much momentum you feel has come your way. I mean, 27 points from Yale. That's a, that's a big number against a defense this good for the Big Green. So. Uh, Coach Mack, had you guys figured something out in the second half? Because it's been dominant on the defensive end for the Big Green. Yeah, we felt like we got a, we had a beat on them. Uh, we had a, you know got a pretty good idea what they were trying to do. And obviously, it, it, not that they were playing conservative, but I think they definitely when it came to the pass game, it was a little bit more of a controlled. You know, you know so in this game, there's a lot of a lot of under routes, a lot of drive routes. Um, you know, we did a good job of you know, preventing the big plays uh, in the second half and forcing them to have to try to dink it and uh, keep it everything in front of us. And once again, you know, continuously make them work at it and force them to make mistakes. But our guys are playing with confidence now. Uh, they're feeling, they know, hey, you know, we know we're you know, putting ourselves in the right spot and uh, we're able to kind of pin our ears back a little bit here and be a little bit more aggressive as opposed to kind of sitting back and feeling things out like we did in the first half. Game, 6.53 to go, fourth quarter. Hennigan looking for somebody open. He'll, instead, he'll go deep and then just out of the reach of Emory. I think what's uh, pretty cool to see, too, is just the, the, the progression over the years. Um, you know, I can uh, see, see it Hang most on. Clearly on defense, because that's what I, I pay attention to. But, um, you know, on, on defense this year, we always found a way to get it done. Um, it wasn't always the prettiest, but we always found a way to get it done. Um, then coming back the next year, I think we just played, you know, found a way to play cleaner throughout the whole game. Um, and then, you know, this past year, they, they did that even more. Um, so that, I think, is really cool to see the progression um, over the years like that, um, especially now as an alum. Um, it, it, it's really neat. Roughing the passer penalty keeps the drive alive, and Dartmouth's taking big time advantage of with this great throw to Ryder Stone. Stays in bounds? Wow. Yeah, I probably chirped in his ear on that one for you, Kevin. Dartmouth wanting to run a play quickly. Second reception today for Stone. Oh, this is a nice job by Jack right here. Off the bounding time, away from the pressure, put it up there for Dylan. That was an interesting one because um, I thought that that ball was going to me. Um, I had gotten in a pretty good position, and then I look over to my left, and, and Dylan's right there, and Dylan makes a, a great catch on this one. Um, and then to be able to finish it off with the touchdown, I think, gave us the momentum we needed to continue that comeback. 
Had a little juice there after that one, honey cut. <laughs> I... And they called pass interference on the defense, too. Yeah. Obviously declined, but... Yeah, that guy was all over him, and he, um, he fought through and was able to finish that one. Jack, did he just he, he did such a good job. It's such a catchable ball. I mean, he put the ball in the right spot. And uh, you know, that, that's that's a tough, tough pass to defend. I don't care how tight the coverage you have. That's, it makes it very difficult. That was a nice hold right there, Drew. It, it looks like uh, it's kind of a low, low snap. Thank you. Yeah, I think that this game, um, I had to take off my gloves because – I think that the sweat was just um, making it really, really moist. And um, that was something that, you know, after we scored, I immediately thought, like, okay, we need to make sure that we get this next point because we're going to need every single one. I think you make you make the tackle on this one. Um, oh, there you go. Taking me back to my safety days. Yale. <laughs> And that's what I'm talking about. You know, just we, you know, we got guys from all positions that are involved in our special teams that, that they want to be part of that. And, you know, Drew, as a wide receiver, realizes how important it is to get down there and, and pin these guys back and allow our defense the chance to go three and out and force them to punt and, and deep in their territory and allow us an opportunity to get the ball midfield. So, um, but a guy like Drew, who's just unselfish and want to be part of all phases. And our guys know, you know, you know, potentially if they want to play at the next level, the first thing an NFL scout's going to ask is, is, does he play special teams? And that's one of the, that's one of the, the, the better ways to try to get on a, on a roster is through special teams. And it's uh, it's high praise when, when Coach Mack is saying, telling offensive guys that they're good at special teams. Uh, you know, especially, uh, you know, Honeycutt, Charles Mack was another guy. Uh, he got hurt this year, I think, in the Penn game, but he was a guy that was always good at special teams. And then, obviously, Emery, you know, might be one of the best kick cover guys. Um, I Probably the best is, – is the best kick cover guy I've ever seen uh, personally. Um, I'm sure he's probably, probably up there on, on Coach Mack's list as well. So, so when Coach Mack is giving compliments to the the offensive guys on special teams, that's that's serious right there. Well, yeah, I think that we could make the same play. Um, and if it was an offensive guy, I think he'd give some praise. And a defensive guy is like, okay, on to the next one. Um, so, but, yeah, I, I loved playing special teams, and it was something that – um, I knew it was going to be vital if I wanted to be able to get on the bus at, uh, early in my career. And I think that you know, making it a point of, you know, being important and it really does affect the game, especially in this one with, you know, field position being critical um, for this comeback. It was, it was good. There is a running back in the backfield, Dudek. They've used him as a safety. You just sense the energy now. Just our guys are just playing a little different speed now. Little, you know, once here we do a good job. Danny McManus does a really good job. He knows the sticks. He knows where we are. Uh, looks like we're in a dime package there. So you know, we want to make sure we keep everything in front. And Danny does. He's a, he's a disciplined, disciplined player. It's a good job keeping it in front and running on it and forcing these guys to have to punt. To prevent that first down. Now he goes back into a punt coverage. Great pressure off the edge. Yeah, I think a lot of it was just, you know, we got enough possessions in that fourth quarter to to win this game because the defense did a great job getting us the ball back. Yale's punter, Alex Gallon, will kick. Drew, before we move on from the special teams topic, how did you get the job as the holder? For the kicks. Um, I don't exactly remember how it came about. Um, I know that ours had graduated the year before. My dad actually um, held in college at Texas Tech. And um, so that was something that, you know, I had done for a little bit and had a little background knowledge about, um, but never actually did it in high school or anything. And so um, I just always wanted to be on the field. And so uh, if that was an opportunity to be able to, to get out there again, then um, I was going to try and take advantage of it. So um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to do it senior year with my whole knee injury and it being difficult to get in that position. But it was fun while it lasted. Oh, he's just being modest. He has the best hands on the team. That's why he did it. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's what I, I thought either that or maybe I had quarterback experience and you could be using a fake, which we, we saw on a, on a run fake uh, earlier in our Woods Watch party. You, you almost got there. I, but I didn't, so <laughs> I, I definitely have thought about that. And, you know, being able to score on a fake field goal would have been pretty cool to say, but I just didn't work out, unfortunately. And again, little inside pass. That'll go complete for seven. Another three and out, meanwhile. So three in a row from this defense coming up clutch. And it's really been a narrative for this team from like right now to what five even more than that years back. Just dominant defense. And it feels like a, a clutch defense. And we've seen that in each week so far of the Woods Watch Party. And that's got to have the offense feeling pretty good, Coach Daff, knowing that. If you can do your job, there's a pretty good chance that score is going to stay at 27 in this game. Yeah, it definitely has helped. You know, they keep you, you know, our defense keeps us in a lot of ball games, as you saw this past year also. And so, um, you know, but like I said before, we have very unselfish coaches and players, and we're all in it together. And, you know, sometimes it's offense, sometimes it's defense, sometimes it's certain players. So it's – it's really neat to see everyone kind of come together and, and different people step up at different times. Well, they're running the play. There's the snap. In passes caught. And it's Miller. Still on his feet. Miller out of the 40. Yeah, Dylan, Dylan's having a nice game. He caught a couple of those slants right there. And this was a huge drive. This is pretty intense time of the game. Miller had himself quite a day. His sixth reception. Of the afternoon, including the good job up front to our offensive line. It seemed like in the second half, they did a really good job of giving Jackson time. You know, and, and Yale does a lot of movements and stunts up front. And, uh, they did a good job of sifting through that and protecting Jackson, giving that extra second. We were very fortunate to have the offensive line that we did, um, especially throughout my career. And I think that, you know, with all the success that I had, none of it would have been able to happen without, without them. And so, um, it was a really special group and a, a really fun group as well. Um, I'm sure that, you know, getting more into the, my senior year games, um, there's some moments where uh, they are just dominating people and um, it's fun to watch. And we're at 2.50 left to play in this football game. It's turned into a good one. Miller moves in motion to the left. Hennigan takes the snap. He's had a lot of time. And there's running room here for the quarterback. 50, 45. And yeah, I think Jack ended up uh, leading the leading the rusher in this game. He had some nice timely uh, well, rushes. See a scramble two. right there. He did a nice job. Over. Didn't hesitate. Hennigan. Nothing was there, and he just Seems took off. That's a great there job. A lot of running room and a great read by the senior from California. He's trying to get out of bounds. Yeah. The Yale 41. Yeah, yeah. Time was not not a huge factor just yet. You can see it ticking down. Oh, this would have been sweet for Dylan. He's always uh, he's always asking me to put in a double pass, and he's always wanting to throw it. So he underthrew it though. Yeah, that was a long throw though. It was like 45 yards or something. Yeah. And he had a run and set up, so we narrowly missed that one. That was something that Dylan and I always went back and forth of. Um, I mean, I remember in practices we would just be doing long toss um, before and warming up the arms, especially if Coach Staff had worked up a, a trick play that someone was going to need to throw it, and um, both of us wanted to see that guy. Good break for Yale, second down, 10 for Dartmouth from the 41. Quarterback has it, Hennigan's right up the middle. He's got running room, 35, and down to the 32. Yeah, you can almost sense first down. right there when he saw the, the, essentially spread out the box with that empty look, and you can tell Jack, he could see that and feel that. That was this great decision. Third down for the big green and obvious four down territory with 150. And you said time's not a factor, Coach Daff, but if Miller hits that trick play touchdown, good chunk of time for Yale to come back with the ball, and they would only need a field goal in theory. But the way the defense has been playing, I, I can imagine why that's not a factor because Yale's not moving the ball at all right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the way this one kind of plays plays itself out is is now you know you're in you're in the red zone so. You got a minute and a half left. Now it's a matter of, you know, I think for us it was more like, hey, let's score a touchdown. You obviously want to leave least amount of time on as possible, but you don't want to play too close to the vest. 
because uh, you still need to, to take the lead. The backfield now he circles out and Hannigan has five receivers in formation. I don't know if I've ever seen someone uh, a quarterback use someone Hannigan else's right towel here, before the, the play like that. <laughs> and it's incomplete. That's a tough play because there's such a who is he using? Down. Is he uh, one of the running backs? Back yeah, Meller was in the backfield and uh, before he sent him in motion, he, he used his towel to draw off his hands. From the 20 yard line, 106 to play. Cube is also the one of the most and calm, collected people uh, you'll ever meet. So it didn't matter whether we're up 100, down 100, tie game, one second left, full game left. Um, he had the exact same expression, exact same tone. Um, I think that was one of the things that uh, he was really great at, especially as a leader. Um, he kept everyone, you know, he, he was the rock for everyone. He kept everyone uh, grounded, um, didn't let anyone get too excited, didn't want to get too down on themselves um, and, and help keep us focused. That was a great play by Estrada there, knocking that ball loose. Right now, that was a great job. Left. You need the 10 yards to be able to create some new plays. Like third and 10, Coach Stafford, are you looking for anyone in particular? Do you want to get the ball in the hands of a Honeycutt or a Meller because they've been so good? Or what's your mindset here when you're looking at play calls? Yeah, definitely Drew and Dylan. Those are the guys that go to in this game. Um, they're Dylan making the catch right there. You know, it's third and 10. We need a touchdown, so... Even though it's it's uh, you know we have two more downs to get that first down, but uh, yeah at this point and we had talked to Jack about it too is is, is uh, like I said Drew and Dylan are are on another level right now so we want to make sure we get the ball in their hands. The game right here fourth and five. Looking end zone. Oh, oh, that was awesome. Honeycutt did good making the seam right there. I'll just say something that most people don't know is uh, Dylan and I were actually supposed to be um, switched. And so I was supposed to be in the backfield and go to where he was, and he was supposed to be running this route. Um, but this is actually my, my favorite route that we ever ran. Um, it's one of those vendors where if you can get in the blind spot of uh, the backer or the safety, um, you're in that right perfect hole. And um, Jack threw a, a perfect ball. Um, I really didn't have to do much other than just, you know, look it in and, and make sure that we are in the end zone. And, um, but then also getting up, realizing that, hey, it's a tie ball game. We still have to kick the extra point and uh, not just tie this up, but actually go and win it. It is. You have like uh, jitters after the touchdown for the for the hold, or you're just still smooth, smooth honey cut. I I remember getting up and um, thinking like, you know, I, I want to be very excited right now, but yeah, definitely the hold is something. And like I said earlier, um, I was having some issues with you know using gloves holding, and so uh, got a perfect snap. And, Smitty hit a, a perfect ball, and uh, it's good to see that you know all that was to end up being on top. Oh, oh, go. a young Mermigus. <laughs> hey, uh, uh, there's player. about four young. I mean, we got four, five, six freshmen that you know are on this kickoff coverage team. So we, we play a lot of young guys, especially on special teams, to give them some experience. And yeah, they, they do a they do a phenomenal job as a group. As a unit, we know they have some playmakers. And first and foremost, I want to know where 84 is on the field. Christopher Williams. Now the prevent question: How much cushion do you give him? What's the approach? Three-man rush. It looks like. What's the setup here? The thing you got to be aware of: you say all they need is a field goal. You know, so you don't, you know, you got to be, you know, when you say the word prevent, you know, obviously you, you don't want to give too much cushion. Where, you know, and they got 31 seconds left. And, um, you know, you, you want to force it, you know, like for right here, to me, this is a bad decision by this guy. The fact that he ran up inside, the clock's still rolling. Uh, you know, they had a timeout. But the biggest thing is you don't want to allow him to, to work the sidelines on you, and you don't want to give up a big chunk. Um, so, you know, obviously being disciplined and, and then mixing up your pressure every once in a while um, to force that quarterback to make a quick decision. Well, let's face it, look pretty bleak at halftime for the big green now, these timeouts i'm guessing you're just reminding everyone of the fundamentals 
as uh, an excited but nervous crowd looks on. Yeah, you definitely defensively, you're telling guys, uh, you know, it, it's, you know, recognize formations, um, you know, do your job, be disciplined, communicate, make sure everybody's on the same page too. And that's the critical, that's the one thing you want to talk about when you time out is everybody's on the same page and there's, there's not any miscommunication. And, uh, and then just situational stuff, um, knowing how much time's left and how far they got to get and letting them know the field goal range. And uh, just you know, all those covering all your bases. A couple of touchdowns. The game was for 10 yards on the pass play, so it's a first down and 10 for Yale. Here like Kai said, the pressure. Yale right now. They got to make the go play. Very long down the sidelines. There's some bumping that ball's picked off, but it's going to be a penalty. It's going to go against McManus. Downfield. I was in good shape. What do you think, Kai? That was a bad call. Yeah, I thought that was. I mean, I actually, this is, I feel like I, I definitely didn't see that when I was uh, playing. I think I got on a blitz on that play. For Yale. Pass interference. Defense number twenty-seven. Fifteen yards. Yeah, I thought he played the ball really well there. Got his eye, got his eyes back. Actually made the pick too, huh? Yeah, I think they they said he made a, he made collision a little bit earlier in the route. But I didn't think the ball was in the air when he did make that collision. Pass interference is only a only. A 15-yard penalty. Luckily, not a spot foul. If they yeah. get it all the way, you're in real trouble. Because yeah. now the clock is down to 16 seconds. So once again, defensively, just knowing where we are in the field and where they've got to get. First and 10 from the 45-yard line. Look like McManus. Three guys up front. Hopefully, get a little pressure, and you got a lad on late. Over the middle, and that ball through the hands of Dudek down to 12. To go. What's Drew Honeycutt feeling like right now after the game time touchdown and the go ahead hold? What's uh, what are your nerves like watching the defense? I'm uh, I'm very very anxious, um, but also you know if anyone's going to be in the situation, it's going to be our defense and um, you know have the utmost faith in them. Um, so I think that it was more so how is it going to how are they going to close it out and um, if they're going to make us sweat a little more than need be. They're second and ten from the forty-five. Quarterback under Great pressure up front. Right. Anytime you make a quarterback do this and throw across the field, only bad thing happens. That was a great hit. Yeah, a great job by Danny. That might be one of my uh, my favorite McManus plays of all time um, <laughs> of all the programs I did. That was a that was a big one. There's a bunch of them. Yeah. And the flag is holding on Yale, so the Big Green win it. And guys, I, I don't know if you knew it at the time, but that is the biggest comeback in Dartmouth football history. 21 nothing to 28-27. And we'll, uh, we'll get your reactions one at a time as we check out this final play. Yeah, it, was great. It, was just, it was great being part of this, there's no doubt about it. And as soon as you saw that ball, let him roll out and have to throw across the field. And, Seeing where Danny was, you know, I you know, knew we were in a good spot, good position to make a play. Yeah, it was fun to be a part of. I didn't realize it until after. I remember people talking about it in the, in the offices after. And, uh, you know, it, it was an exciting game, you know. Tail two halves, you know, we didn't offensively get stuff going in the first half, but we turned it on and guys stepped up, made some plays, and Drew came up huge. So it, it was fun to be a part of quarterback through three touchdown passes. Yeah, just, uh, I mean, this this whole season, it was uh, amazing to be a part of so many just absolute dog fights of games. Um, and it, it was just great to be a part of a team that um, was just going to fight with everything they had every week. Um, and it was, a, it was a really special year because of that. Yeah, this is one of those special moments where um, it's always great to um, – you know, line up and and, and sing the fight song, but um, to to do it with this type of situation was you know particular very special. I mean, I think it really did fuel the rest of this season and um, the season after that, and you know, letting us know that you know no matter what the situation is, um, we're still in it, and that I just got to have faith in, in both sides of the ball. Well, it's been really fun to watch you guys watch these games during our Woods Watch party so far this season. I want to give you one last chance to sign off to everyone, shout outs, whatever you want. Uh, but can't thank you guys enough for making this so fun and sharing your insights on what's been a, 
a fun season to create while we wait for the Big Green to get back on the field. And uh, why don't we start with uh, Coach Mack and uh, that great defensive performance. We'll give you uh, your final word to help us sign off. Well, Ben and Ty, we thank both of you guys for doing this. This is pretty awesome. I'm um, just enjoying being with these guys and seeing Drew and Kai um, and also all the, all the former players that played for us and just being a part of this program and where it's come and where it's going. And just I'm um, very lucky and very blessed to, to be here and, and be able to be part of the big green and hats off to all the individuals who, who are watching this and the alums and everybody who's part uh, uh, the support staff and everybody that helps uh, help us get, um, you know, where we are and, and, and the success we've had. So thanks to everybody and go big green. Coach Daft, you're up next. Yeah, it was, it was fun. I, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to relive this with a couple former players. Great to see Drew and Kai and, um, you know, same, same thing with Coach Mack. I, I feel very fortunate to be a part of this program. It's very special. It's a special place and uh, can't say enough good things about it. And, uh, you know, it's pretty fun to relive a game, especially one like that. Now, Kai, that wasn't as bad as you thought it was going to be, right? You were um, That was fine. I mean – I, I, I'm just, again, I'm one of those guys that the, the bad plays, I just, I don't know if I'll ever uh, get over them really. Um, so it was, it was still pretty bad. Um, I try to keep myself composed. I think Ryder was a little stressed himself out too much last week. Uh, so I tried to stay calm, um, but it was really fun. Um, it, it's great to watch the games, especially from this angle. Um, you know, uh, as players, we don't get to see this stuff. Um, from this angle, we're watching, you know, a, a cut up of film. So I really appreciate, I really appreciate you guys doing this. Um, it, it's awesome. Thank you guys. Uh, thank you everyone. Uh, Darwin football making my experience so great. Um, and it was awesome being here with uh, Coach Mack, Coach Daff, and uh, Money Cut. We we will go to Money Cut now for your final word, Drew. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I really appreciate um, being able to be a part of this. Um, I knew that logistically it was going to be difficult to find a you know. Not, block of time to be able to do this but uh, when I was told that you know I could have the opportunity to talk about Dartmouth football um, I you know was elated because um, it, it's fun to talk about you know what Dartmouth has um, provided me and, and my experiences there and um, I would not be with the, the company I am today and in the position I am um, without Dartmouth uh, it was a special season with a, a special you know, group of players and, and coaches and um, I definitely will you know look back at uh, this game for a long time but yeah like I said thank you so much for for having us and uh, go Big Green. Great to have you guys here couldn't do it without you can't wait for next week and want to thank our friends at Milton Cat for being the presenting partner of today's game. Milton Cat is your complete source for Caterpillar machines, engines, generators, technology, parts and service in the Northeast. Biggest comeback in program history from 21 nothing down Dartmouth beats Yale 28-27 back in 2017 at homecoming. We'll see you next week, everybody, on the Woods Watch Party.